then I think it, it'll it'll take a little while for participants to join, but we, we'll give it a couple of minutes and uh, then get started. Hi right, folks, we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, hi everyone. So, um, you know, we'll just give people another couple of minutes to um, to log in. But uh, in the meantime, um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this RAS specialist discussion meeting on the uh, recent HERA upper limits. Um, in a second, I'm I'm just going to show you a slide with a few basics, like what the schedule is today uh, and how the Zoom webinar stuff works. Um, so we'll get started with that in just a second. Um, once uh, a few more people have been able to log in.
Okay, shall we get started? So, hi again, everyone. Um, welcome to this RIS specialist discussion meeting. Uh, we're really pleased to have you joining us today. Um, this is all about the first results from the Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array. Hopefully, I only have to say that once. It's HERA from now on. Um, and we, we recently, as an experiment, had our first um, uh, main uh, report of, of upper limits on the 21 centimeter power spectrum uh, during the, the epoch of reionization. Um, so the idea today is we'll, <clears throat> we'll have a few talks from um, mostly people within the HERA collaboration explaining various things about um, the instrumentation, um, the data analysis that was done um, on this, this particular data set, um, and then the science interpretation of the data. And, and, and our hope is that um, everyone will be able to, um, first of all, see uh, in a bit more detail what's going on in these results and, um, you know, why, why we think they're, they're an interesting um, first batch of results from, from the experiment. And uh, we also hope it'll, it'll be reasonably interactive uh, and you can ask questions and, and have us answer them uh, directly on uh, anything, no matter how non-technical or technical. Um, we're, we're hoping quite a few uh, people from the HERA collaboration with varying expertise will be here, uh, particularly at the end of the day when there's a Q&A session um, where we, we anticipate it can just be a free for all. If you have any questions whatsoever, um, we can get into discussing those and, and particularly people working on um, uh, other experiments uh, in, in this area where we're super interested to hear your feedback um, on these results as well and, you know, potential gotchas and things you've learned from your data as well. So um, I hope this will be a, a nice, fun, and interesting meeting, and uh, not not uh, too much after self, which has been going on the rest of the week. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll just go through um, a few basics. So um, I've already said thank you to um, you for participating, and, and also in advance to our, our, our speakers. I also want to thank the, the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, for supporting this meeting. We're very grateful that uh, they've allowed us to use their infrastructure for this. So thanks to them. Um, we've got a few recorded talks during the session because of time zones. Uh, the time zones with the West Coast uh, of the US don't, don't work out very well. So um, there's a couple of pre-recorded talks uh, that will be playing live on this Zoom this morning. Uh, I'll also provide you with YouTube links to those if you'd prefer to watch um, in that manner instead. Um, but in the afternoon, everything is live um, and we've got a few lightning talks, for example, where people will be advertising um, in, in one or two minute talks, um, some longer talks they've also pre-recorded with more details about various uh, aspects of the analysis too. Uh, and then right at the end is a live Q&A discussion from 2.30 till 3.30 uh, that I've already mentioned. Um, I've cobbled together a, a very simple website. Uh, I've popped that in the chat. A link to that is in the chat, but it's, um, it's here as well. Um, and that's got this timetable, links to some of the YouTube videos. Um, and there's also a, a, a document, a Google Doc, uh, that we'll be using to keep a few notes. If anyone wants to participate and add their own notes to that, uh, you're more than welcome. And I should say this, this is all being done as a, a Zoom uh, webinar, which means um, it, you, you can do things like um, ask questions in the chat or add questions to the Q&A. We don't mind which. And then at the end of the talk, those can be queued up for the speaker to answer. Um, for the pre-recorded talks, obviously we'll save questions uh, to the live Q&A discussion at the end. Um, and um, I think things like um, raising your hand or, or using your microphone at this point is, is a bit more fiddly. We'll probably save that until the live Q&A discussion, uh, but please do feel free to uh, ask anything you like in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anastasia. I'm, I'm going to ask you to um, share your screen in a second. Um, and she's going to be giving our science overview talk. Hello, uh, everyone. There you go. I will switch my screen off and share my talk. I hope you can see. Yeah, looks great. Please, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for invitation and it's a pleasure to give this talk. It's a very broad overview of the field that you asked me to give, if I understood correctly what your intention was. And uh, after uh, my talk, there, would, there will be Andrea Metzinger's talk uh, more on detailed uh, description of what her upper limits mean in terms of science. And there will be 
also some lightning talks uh, that will go more into details of uh, the astrophysical inter interpretations. So just to note, I will not be able to end the final, final discussion. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to stay a bit longer now and answer questions after my talk. Okay, so just to give you um, a first impression of what HERA upper limits are, and uh, they will be first by uh, Nick Kern and uh, others who will go more into details of how these limits were obtained. So on the left, you see the upper limits uh, uh, on the 21 centimeter power spectrum uh, by HERA of at redshift 7.9, which is the lowest and the most constraining redshift from the astrophysical point of view, and the weaker upper limit at redshift 10.4, which um, uh, is not very constraining in terms of standard astrophysical scenarios. Uh, and on the right, you see a few, several highlights, the science interpretation paper that we wrote uh, recently. And it's a work of a big group of us that put together the effort in explaining what these upper limits mean in terms of science. And uh, uh, we consider different astrophysical scenarios uh, of uh, models in which um, ionization is dominated by galaxies that was led by Andre Messinger's group. Uh, and I'm sure he will go more in details in his talk. So here I will not discuss his uh, uh, models and interpretation and I leave that task to him entirely. Uh, we also considered models uh, with uh, extra radio background, which uh, was led by student Stefan Heinersheim, who is online and is given one of the lightning talks. Uh, and uh, also there are models that are uh, in which dark matter interacts with uh, gas and affects the predictions for the 21 centimeter signal uh, and other scenarios. So work done by uh, uh, Julian Munoz and also uh, Jordan Miroc, uh, that they all described in the paper and they hope Andre in his longer interpretation talk will go more uh, into details of all the scenarios. So here I'm given a broad overview since I didn't recognize most of the names. So actually on the participants list, I'll go a bit more uh, slowly into what we are actually doing with HERA. Uh, and HERA is an interferometer looking to detect 21 centimeter power spectrum from at the moment realization that is stretch of 10 and 8. So this is the epoch when uh, more massive galaxies uh, were forming and they were actively ionizing the gas. However, we didn't get to the stage instantaneously. The universe took uh, almost 14 billion years uh, or 13 billion years to evolve to that uh, point, uh, starting from the small fluctuations uh, that we observe in the CMB that gradually grew, formed halos uh, of dark matter that could accrete gas, start formation of very small uh, galaxies and mini halos that uh, were affecting the intergalactic medium by heating and reionizing it. So on this plot that I took from a recent uh, review of uh, Leon Koopman et al, uh, we see how the reionization proceeds. And first we start with small uh, galaxies uh, during cosmic dawn, so very early on. Their forming, formation timing depends on various astrophysical assumptions and can happen as early as just a few tens of million years after uh, the Big Bang. So they can start forming very early on, but they are also very inefficient in ionizing the gas. They have different other impacts on the intergalactic medium that I will mention in this talk. Uh, so this process of realization at first is very slow, but then it uh, picks up and uh, happens more quickly as soon as more massive galaxies form. So the 21 centimeter signal that we observe uh, or predict for in, within the HERA range does not only depend on realization, as again, I will show more in detail in this talk. It actually depends on various uh, other processes such as line alpha coupling and heating uh, of the gas that uh, starts ve start very early on uh, at cosmic dawn, but they can be important all the way throughout uh, cosmic history and they can have strong implications for the 21 centimeter signal that we hope to observe with HERA. So we don't need to take into account uh, 
the whole evolution history of the universe to reliably make predictions for the signals within the observed range. So there are various probes of ionization, and uh, since this is a specialist discussion, I'm not going into details uh, in other uh, probes such as quasars uh, and high retro galaxies, but just to mention there is a uh, mountain evidence uh, mounting evidence that the realization ended later on after H6. Uh, and uh, there are, on the other hand, there are hints uh, that it, start, it could have started early. For example, there are very massive galaxies detected at high redshifts uh, by, for example, Alma. He's uh, oxygen three in galaxy at redshift 9.1. Uh, and also there are supermassive black holes and high redshift quasars observed at uh, redshifts uh, at, uh, uh, above seven even. Uh, and uh, if we, and uh, the recent edges detection, we still don't know if it's uh, real or an artifact, but if it's true, then it's a probe of star formation at redshift 20 already. So this uh, evidence together hints that uh, there might be interesting processes going on at, at the early universe uh, and the 21 centimeter signal would be a very interesting probe on, and maybe the only probe of uh, these processes. So I will discuss these processes in my talk and uh, most of them are relevant for HERA, uh, for the signals that we hope to observe with HERA. So it will be uh, putting the, uh, um, accent on these processes that are actually relevant, mostly relevant. So to put uh, all this uh, evidence uh, in context, we have the CMB observations of the universe when it was very young, a stretch of around 1000, uh, and they show us the snapshot of the universe at that time. So just tiny fluctuations in the temperature of uh, 10 to the minus five in magnitude. And then we have, on the other hand, we have observations of all the cosmic web and galaxies and quasars. And uh, we have the surveys that cover large fields of view, roughly out of to redshift three. Uh, and at higher redshifts, we have um, fewer and fewer ob observations. Uh, and this, the highest redshift galaxy is detected at redshift 11. It's just a blob that you can see here. It's not very well resolved. Uh, and the brightest quasars, uh, one of them, for example, is a stretch of 7.5. Uh, so they also are very rare and uh, can give us only limited information about uh, how ionization happened. And they also encode information along the line of sight to each quasar. So uh, 21 centimeter will hopefully fill the gap between the observations of the CMB and this uh, high redshift galaxies and quasars. And we'll convey the information on how these processes of um, star formation, uh, structure formation, heating and ionization occurred, and what was their timing, and uh, what were the details of sources that powered these processes. So, 21 centimeter signal is produced by neutral hydrogen in the intergalactic medium between star forming regions. Uh, and when this atom, had neutral hydrogen, undergoes a spin flip transition, due to interactions between spins of proton and electron, it creates a 21 centimeter wavelength photon that is not absorbed because it's a forbidden transition. So it can free stream uh, from the moment of being created to us, and then we can detect it or put limits on it, uh, on the signal that we have for now uh, with HERA. So uh, there are multiple telescopes. HERA is the, not the only one in the field. Uh, it's part of the international effort. Uh, and there are experiments such as EDGES and SARAS and uh, REACH that uh, is planned in Cambridge. So these are experiments that are looking at the sky average signal uh, and uh, try to measure the average evolution of this 21 centimeter signal with time, which gives us a spectrum because uh, this is a narrow line and it's redshifted. So 21 centimeter intrinsically becomes a wavelength of up to a few meters uh, when it uh, goes through the universe that is expanding. So this uh, 
edges and saras are uh, relatively simple experiments. They are monopole, uh, dipole antennas, and they are uh, basically tabletop experiments. Uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, interferometers that um, are uh, much more uh, involved uh, and in instruments and I'm not a, an expert on instrumentation, so I will give the discussion to the experts, but uh, there is uh, there are several of those that uh, have already put upper limits on 21 centimeter signal at a variety of redshifts and wave numbers. So HERA is a very impressive interferometer uh, located in South Africa. Uh, and uh, so you will hear uh, today more about it. So just for completeness to uh, note on the edges uh, signal, it was detected by this uh, edges low band antenna. Uh, and it looks like this, like you see on the top left. So we see here an absorption uh, or a dip in the spectrum. Uh, and uh, one of the interpretations is that this is a cosmological signal. It's not the only one, the only interpretation, but uh, the group was confident enough uh, in this uh, absorption trough to publish it. And uh, um, with cosmological interpretation being one of the main uh, possibilities. So if the signal is true, it's uh, the, basically the first light of the first stars that we see in the absorption uh, of the background against the uh, 21 centimeter, against the hydrogen clouds. Uh, and it would uh, correspond to star formation starting in a stretch of around 22. And extra heating uh, starting at redshift around 16 because uh, of the features of the signal uh, that I'll also talk a bit more uh, in a few minutes. So if it's true, it's a very remarkable uh, detection and discovery that uh, informs us on the processes of the very first population of star stars forming at cosmic dome. However, it's a very um, it's still not clear if the signal is true or not, and there are a, a lot of uh, checks and verifications going on at the moment. In particular, the SARAS team um, has built SARAS-3 antenna, and they are already reporting in talks that they don't see the signal. However, they haven't published this paper yet, so it's still in the refereeing process, and uh, we don't know what's going on exactly there yet. So it's still a mystery. So the, uh, the signal, if it's true, it's really an, a, one of the unexpected and surprising results because uh, it sticks out of uh, the predicted cosmological scenarios that you can see here in gray. The edges detection is almost uh, twice as deep and very narrow. And so to explain the signal, one can either, um, from a cosmological point of view, one can either explain it with extra radio background in addition to the CMB or uh, dark matter interactions between gas. Uh, so interactions between dark matter and gas that would deepen the absorption. And again, I will explain more de in detail how do we get that further in the talk. So that's a state, state of the art in the global experiments. There are some upper limits from edges high band and SARS uh, at the ionization era, which rule out extreme scenarios of very cold gas, uh, cold and neutral gas uh, at that time. In terms of interferometers, there are uh, several uh, of these uh, impressive experiments uh, that place limits on, on the high range of power spectrum, so already probing cosmic dome. They are very weak limits still, so above 10 to the 6 millikelvin squared. Uh, these are the very first efforts at the cosmic dome from the experiment from the interferometric point of view, but it's very, uh, very interesting to see that the experiments are getting there and uh, they have data and they will do it, especially low far, for example, at high redshifts, they already collect the data and uh, it's um, processing it at the moment. There are some experiments such as NANUFAR, which is a, an upgraded low far super station located in France, uh, which has uh, sensitivity to measure 
extreme models such as I will be mentioning later today. It's, uh, it will barely touch standard of astrophysical scenarios at cosmic dawn, but it can either detect or rule out models uh, such as uh, suggested by edges, for example. And uh, of course, HERA also has a hierarchy of band that I didn't have details to put it on the spot yet. So apologies for that. Uh, also, at the lower redshifts, so there are uh, several experiments, including low RMWA and now HERA, that place upper limits on the 21 centimeters power spectrum from uh, the epoch of ionization. Uh, and currently, HERA is the best limit that we have to constrain scenarios. Uh, and again, in this interpretation paper and the, in the later talks today, uh, and I'll also mention some of that, uh, we can actually start constraining astrophysical models with this data point at 7.9, which is uh, extremely interesting already. So HERA provides the best uh, upper limit for the 21 centimeter power spectrum that we currently have, uh, and thus the strongest constraints that we have on the epoch of ionization at redshift around eight. But that also translates into constraints on the whole thermal history of the gas, because as I mentioned earlier, we do need to integrate over the whole history of the universe, for example, to calculate gas temperatures uh, at redshift eight. So this constraint is uh, very telling from the point of view. So just a note on the future uh, for those in the audience who are not from the very close field. So 21 centimeter signal, uh, as I mentioned, will bridge the gap between the CMB observations and the uh, quasar and galaxy observations at lower redshifts. And eventually with the interferometers, so we can tomographically map the entire universe basically and learn about uh, the formation of stars and galaxies and uh, their heating and ionization effects on the intergalactic medium. Uh, and the hope is to have uh, the full tomographic scan of the universe, which will tell us about the timing of cosmic events, astrophysical properties of high redshift sources. Uh, it will test cosmology in this uh, new regime that has not been observed yet. Uh, and we'll also maybe test, we'll provide tests of dark matter physics also, because our early universe is uh, very different from what we see today. Uh, it's denser. Uh, stars form in smaller dark matter halos, and this provides tests of uh, dark matter clustering properties and also dark matter interactions uh, with gas that can be tested through this 21 centimeter signal. Uh, and uh, in particular, to go into dark ages before star formation and above redshift uh, 30, uh, we do need to go to space for this science. Uh, goals and there are, uh, because ionosphere blocks low frequency radio waves. So, just to be able to detect them, we need to go to space for that. Uh, we would also avoid radio frequency interference from space and uh, have a clear, more clear view uh, on the higher edge of the universe. So, there are several missions that are already being um, discussed and planned and even uh, operational. Uh, such as MCLE, which is Netherlands Chinese mission, uh, that are uh, building towards uh, this uh, effort and detecting 21 centimeter signal from space. So there is a whole range from uh, radio, uh, in radio interferometers on the moon surface, uh, a chain of satellites, uh, DSL, uh, rotating around the uh, moon, as we see here, uh, there are experts in the audience, so if you have a questions, we can uh, discuss that. Uh, and also satellites rotating around the moon, uh, such as DEPR here. So it's uh, very exciting. And this field just gains uh, in, uh, against momentum more and more and uh, really exciting times. Uh, so now I'll be talking about astrophysical processes that affect 21 centimeter signal. And uh, I have already mentioned several stages, such as dark ages, cosmic dawn, and epoch of ionization. Uh, and the universe and the evolution of the universe are driven by various different processes uh, at all the stages. 
for example, in dark ages, there are no stars at all yet. Cosmic Dawn is dominated by a small dark matter halos, which form the very first uh, galaxies and stars. Uh, and then the epoch of realization is dominated by massive galaxies. So the universe evolves, and with that, the 21 centimeter signal also evolves. So here you see the a light cone of how the 21 centimeter signal would look like uh, if you go uh, if you travel in time from uh, uh, on the x-axis in the it's a cut through the universe on the y-axis. So we see that it's non-uniform, oscillates and evolves uh, in time. So one of the main processes that uh, determine the 21 centimeter signal and its shape uh, is the balance between the radio background radiation that uh, backlits the clouds of uh, hydrogen gas and the gas kinetic temperature. Uh, so uh, the contrast between these two processes will tell us how strong the 21 centimeter signal is. Uh, and at later stages, when ionization becomes important, it also the gas ionizes and we have uh, less and less neutral hydrogen available to produce 21 centimeter signal. So main, the main processes that drive the signal are line alpha uh, photon production that couples the 21 centimeter line to the gas kinetic temperature. And it kicks in as soon as first stars form, so it's very high redshift. However, it can take time uh, to uh, produce enough photons, and so uh, line alpha coupling can play a role also at lower redshift. Uh, then, so contrast between gas temperature and radio background uh, is a very important process. Uh, ionization history and also dark matter physics can affect the amount of star forming halos and uh, the gas temperature. So as I already stressed, it's just, I think, a very important point to uh, take from my talk is that uh, the signals that are in the HERA range uh, that can be constrained by HERA, they're not just created at that point, but they're results of the evolution of the universe from the initial conditions uh, that we see in the CMB to the later times. So we do need to solve all these equations and evolve temperature and then ionization of the intergalactic medium uh, through the cosmic history. And what we see with, uh, within the Hera range is the uh, result of this uh, uh, evolution. So there are several main processes that I mentioned uh, and several subtle processes that also have strong impact on this 21 centimeter signal that I also mentioned briefly today. Uh, but another important point to take uh, out is that these processes that they're non-uniform, for example, star formation happens on, uh, in a patchy way at high redshifts and ionization is also very patchy. So 21 centimeter signal that results from this uh, picture is also very non-uniform. There are fluctuations and that actually contributes the power spectrum that uh, we constrain with Hera. So these fluctuations come from several sources. For example, lamina lam alpha coupling uh, is non-uniform radio emission. If it's created by galaxies, uh, then it would contribute to non-uniform radio background. Heating uh, by different sources is also patching, uh, imprints uh, heated bubbles and, uh, and so on. So that's a whole uh, very complex evolution. So a bit more into astrophysical process and feel if I'm running out of time, I don't have a clock here, please let me know. Uh, no, no problem. Okay, so as I mentioned, one of the fundamental processes is lamp alpha coupling, and it actually enables uh, observation of 21 centimeter line at all because it couples uh, the spin temperature to the temperature of the gas that is colder than the background radiation. And then we can see it actually on this background warmer background that is usually assumed to be the same beam. So without line alpha coupling, uh, the 21 centimeter line would be in thermal equilibrium with the same beam and we would see nothing. So as soon as stars turn on uh, on this picture at the bottom, the spin temperature that is an effective temperature of the 21 centimeter line and it's shown here with a solid line. Uh, so it, it goes to the temperature of the CMB without the stars, but as soon as stars turn on, they will couple this temperature to the temperature of the gas and the contrast uh, increases 
and that gives us the observable 21 centimeter signal. So it's very important to have stars. Uh, and uh, also by observing this uh, 21 centimeter signal in the future with the uh, higher Hera redshift band or uh, Nenufar or the SK, we can constrain the process of first star formation. Uh, this this uh, process, uh, uh, the coupling can happen either very early on if mini halos dominate and stars form in small dark matter halos, but it can also happen much later if we, we only have massive galaxies or they, on, they dominate, so they will shift everything to lower redshifts. Uh, and this coupling can take some time. It's not instantaneous, so it might be that uh, the process of coupling itself uh, can be important in the Hera bands. But the uh, conventional thinking is that the line of a coupling is saturated and there are a lot of line of photons already around uh, at the Hera redshifts. So, uh, yeah. So, on this bottom right pa panel, you can see that uh, in the simulations uh, where we ran a large number of such models, uh, we get the peak of line of a coupling in the power spectrum that can happen as early as redshift 40 or as late as redshift 13. So there is a large uh, variety of models uh, when this line alpha coupling happens. And uh, in the future, when we have interferometers that are looking into cosmic dome, they will see line alpha couple of bubbles. So it's an effect that is not uh, instantaneous. The, uh, Lamina alpha photons in the lamina alpha band are produced by galaxies, and then they uh, have some uh, mean free path. Uh, this top uh, left panel shows the window function of lamina alpha photons, so they can propagate if they are created slightly uh, above the lamina alpha line, they will redshift and propagate until they are uh, within the lamina alpha uh, line and can be scattered by the gas. So there is some uh, size to line now for coupled bubbles uh, of around a few tenths of uh, megaparsecs. Uh, and in the early conditions of the early universe, we can see these bubbles by telescopes such as square kilometer array, for example. Uh, and the statistics and distribution and properties uh, of this line now for coupled bubbles will depend on the mass of star forming chaos feedback and star formation efficiency. So that would be very interesting to see. The next important process that affects signals in the Hera band uh, is, is heating, and there are several heating candidates. And what heating does is to uh, turn around this uh, gas temperature, which is cooling due to adiabatic expansion of the universe. Uh, and then when there are enough heating agents, it, they will heat up the gas, and eventually it will uh, exceed the temperature of the background radiation. So the 21 centimeter signal would be observed in the absorption all the way uh, at higher at lower reg, at higher redshifts, and then in emission at uh, redshifts where uh, the gas temperature exceeds the uh, background temperature. Uh, and this point uh, and the process of heating varies between different models. So. In the Hera band, we could get models that are either colder than the background radiation and create strong signals due to that, or they are warmer and uh, the signals will be suppressed uh, because the gas, is, uh, the gas temperature is very close to the temperature of the background. So heating history, again, as I pointed several times already, is uh, integrated. So the uh, heating can be produced by different sources and uh, it just accumulates. The gas is heated up and cooled by different processes, and we need to integrate throughout the history to get temperature at every instant, uh, at every redshift. Okay, so what uh, one needs to remember that typically colder gas, if it's much colder than the background radiation, will create stronger 21 centimeter signals, both in global signal absorption and also in the power spectrum. So one main point, main source or conventional thinking is that uh, X-ray binaries are likely to dominate uh, the heating processes and uh, their properties, both intensity and the spectral energy distribution uh, that are not very, very constrained at the moment are both important for the en energy injection into the intergalactic medium and heating rates. 
there is a wide range of models here as well. So on this bottom right, you see this red ellipse uh, that uh, encompasses all models that we got where X-ray heating, so the red dots here are peak, the peak of X-ray heating fluctuations in 21 centimeter signal. Uh, and that shows when X-ray dominates the 21 centimeter power spectrum. And it can be as high as redshift uh, 35 uh, or, or around 30 or as low as redshift uh, as basically the end of realization. So depending on model assumptions, heating processes can happen very early or very late. Uh, and this process has a very strong impact on the power spectrum within the Hera range as well. So one example is uh, if you model X-ray binaries, then it's very important to, uh, or any other sources, it's very important to model the spectral energy distribution because different photons at different energies have uh, different mean free passes in the intergalactic medium. So that means that the uh, higher energy photons will um, inject their energy into the AGM further away from source compared to soft, soft X-ray photons. So if the spectrum is dominated by hard photons, uh, the fluctuations in the 21 centimeter signal imprinted from the um, X-ray heating will be diffused and on larger scales and also uh, not so strong because uh, the universe actually expands during this travel time and uh, the photons redshift, they lose energy due to that. Uh, on the contrary, in the case of soft X-ray spectrum, these fluctuations are on much smaller scales and they are stronger and uh, uh, heating is more efficient overall. So uh, we can see that uh, in this 21 centimeter, uh, in the gas temperature snapshots from one of the old simulations that we've done, uh, on the top you see diffused fluctuations in the case of hard photons and on the bottom is the soft spectrum. So the at the same redshift and total energy output by X-ray binaries is the same, but just spectrum different is different. So you see that the difference in the 20 in the gas temperature is really striking. Uh, and as a result, the 21 centimeter maps look completely different uh, and they have different statistical properties. So it's important to take the spectrum uh, into account, model it, and constrain the data. It does have implications for uh, the uh, the predicted power spectra in the Hera range. So it's uh, spectrum is one thing, and another thing is total intensity of X-rays. We still don't know how in, in, uh, how efficient early X-ray binaries are in heating up the gas. Uh, and varying X-ray spec, X-ray intensity, for example, uh, can have a dramatic impact. For example, compare this black line that assumes very efficient X-ray heating, and this dotted line here that assumes non-existence at X-ray heating. So you see that there is a few orders of magnitude and a large uh, dif difference in terms of redshift evolution between these two lines. Otherwise, they're the same, just X-ray heating intensity is different. So if X-rays are extremely efficient, they will also ionize the gas very early on. That's why this line turns to, uh, culminates here. And they also will over predict X-ray, uh, diffused X-ray background such as uh, observed by Chandra X-ray satellite. So this line specifically here is ruled out, but that, that's just an extreme example of what we can get. Uh, and you see that in the case of no or very weak X-ray heating, the spectra are much higher than typical case for uh, X-ray heating of that is similar to X-ray binaries today. Anastasia, just giving you a two minute warning. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can I have five more minutes? Yeah, that's fine, no problem. Thank you, I'm very slow. So I'll speed up. There are other heating processes, for example, line alpha photons can heat and cool the gas, and that's a very subtle effect that is uh, usually ignored, but it has uh, uh, implications for the 21 centimeter signals in the Hera range uh, and in the other, uh, for other signals, uh, for other experiments that observe the, the EOR. So uh, 
overall lime alpha photons can heat up the gas to temperatures of around 100 Kelvin. So that's non negligible. It, but it only is important in cases when X ray heating is very low. So in models with non, no X-ray heating or weak X-ray heating, we do need to take these processes into account because they will, uh, here on the bottom right, you can see how uh, strong of an effect, effect they might have uh, on the 21 centimeter power spectrum. So it's a few orders of magnitude. Uh, and then it means that uh, usually considered or of uh, the limit of fully coupled and adiabatically cooled gas that is uh, often considered is not actually astrophysically uh, valid because if uh, line alpha coupling is saturated it means there are many a lot of line alpha photons flying around and then they will also heat up the gas uh, so we cannot say that the universe is cooling adiabatically wh while there are line alpha photons around because they will heat it up so that's how line alpha heating affects the bank of uh, global signals and power spectra. So blue lines show models with line alpha heating and black are without line alpha heating. So it's uh, sizable. Uh, adding radio background to the CMB can also have a strong implications for the 21 centimeter signal from Hera range. Uh, and uh, Stefan Hammerstein will talk more about uh, these models in his lightning talk and the recorder talk. Uh, and the main effect here is that the background is raised and then the contrast between background and gas temperature is deeper in the cooling stage and shallower in the, um, so deeper in the absorption and shallower in the emission. So it changes how the signals look like. Uh, if the radio background is created by galaxies, uh, then they, uh, it will change the form of this line of a uh, line of a coupled bubble and will change the whole posterior uh, 21 centimeter signal so these are the examples of how power spectrum uh, looks like in models with and without the extra radio background and even for modest radio background uh, that can be created by slightly more active galaxies than we have today there might be uh, sizable effects on the 21 centimeter signal so just to show you how edges motivated scenarios would look like in the power spectrum. So they would be enhanced if the edges signal is true and is due to radio galaxies. Uh, but the enhancement is mostly at high redshift uh, because uh, that's where we want it to be to, in order to explain edges. So it's around redshift 17. So it might be that the radio background is strong then, but it's weaker today and uh, we don't observe it with Hera. So that's uh, just a highlight of Stefan's talk. I will leave it to him to dis discuss. Uh, we put limits on the radio background intensity and X-ray heating together. Uh, the final important process is the ionization, and it's a very complicated process. Uh, and that's a masterpiece simulation uh, called CODA. And the saw Ilyan Ilyev is online, so he's one of the co-authors here. So that's a very complicated process with absorption, uh, with ionization and uh, recombination and uh, non-uniform structure of this uh, ionized regions. Uh, so I don't have time to, uh, here to go more in details, uh, but in a naive picture uh, that we have sometimes in mind of Swiss cheese model, we would get 21 centimeter signal from neutral hydrogen uh, where uh, whereas uh, ionized gas uh, does not produce a uh, 21 centimeter signal because uh, yeah, there are no hydrogen atoms. So generically, uh, the peak models that can be constrained with HERA, so the peak power spectrum are in those models that are cold and that also have roughly midpoint of ionization happening. So uh, at, in, within the HERA band, so this will give us the strongest signals to constrain. Uh, and of course, there are varieties of models that are below Hera limit just because they either are hotter or they're not so ionized, so their fluctuations are below the limit. So that's a highlight of Andre's talk. So I'll, uh, I'll just leave it to him. They considered a model of realization uh, powered by galaxies uh, and put upper limits uh, on the properties of this model. 
uh, I'm almost done one last slide. So the most uh, the, another important process that can affect one one centimeter signal is uh, if dark matter is weird, it's not cold, but uh, for example, if it interacts with gas, it can cool the gas uh, and such models also were proposed in order to explain edges. Uh, so they would create strong fluctuations within the edges band, but then uh, most of such bond models would predict lower fluctuations at lower redshifts. Uh, and we have a full discussion of this uh, in section seven led by Julian Munoz. Uh, so if you're interested, I'll refer you to that section. Uh, such scenarios are very constrained by other observations uh, such as CMB and supernovae and uh, direct detection experiments. Uh, and uh, so there is a very small window of such models that are left. Uh, in, they sh in this models, dark matter has um, a milli charge, so it's 10 to the minus six times the electric electron charge, uh, and only a small fraction of dark matter can be charged. So that's that's the constraint. Uh, but that's an interesting scenario to consider. Uh, and that brings me to my summary. So I uh, showed you that 21 centimeter signal is rich in information, and uh, we have the first. Uh, limits from HERA that are the best available at the moment uh, at the EUR to constrain astrophysics. There are some subtle effects uh, that needs to be taken into account in order to reliably measure, uh, predict the signal. Uh, we still have the edges mystery uh, alive, so it's really interesting how it will be resolved. Uh, and uh, HERA's limits are strong enough to put weak constraints on standard uh, astrophysical scenarios that will be discussed by Andre Messinger in his talk. Uh, and stronger constraints can be put on models with uh, such as enhanced radio backgrounds models where the power spectrum is boosted compared to standard astrophysical scenarios. And uh, I'm really looking forward to new data releases and uh, more constraining uh, data sets. Thank you very much. Great, that, that, that's great. Thanks very much, Anastasia. Um, so I, I think we can do um, one or two questions if people have them. So, so as I mentioned at the beginning, please, you can pop those into the Q&A um, and Anastasia will be able to see them there, or you can also put them in the chat mm -hmm. if you prefer. And um, as a third option, we'll see how it works. Uh, you can also raise your hand and I should be able to um, Give, give you give you the microphone effectively. And uh, well, well, we'll just give a minute or two for that. Um, I'll remind you there is a Q and A later. So, so Anastasia, I think you can't join the Q and A later. No, um, I'm uh, double booked today. I'm at another meeting, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> There's a lot of it about at the moment. Um, yeah, I'm but, sure Andre or Stefan, they can join. They will. They yeah, will great. Cover. And um, I'm 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 guessing you don't mind if people email you with particular oh, questions as well, if uh, if that yes, comes yes, up. Yes. So there is a question in the Q and A from Tomas. Um, so Tomas asks. Um, can, are you able to see that, Anastasia? Yes. Great. So, so is asking what's the resolution of the code oh, simulation? The simulation, uh, they do resolve small halos. Uh, Ilian, if you're online, help me out. I don't remember <laughs> what the exact resolution is. So it's, uh, I don't know if Ilian can help. But what I remember is around 10 to the 8 solar mass in. Uh, Dark matter kilos. Great. So, so um, please feel free to discuss things like this in the chat the as well. Seven million says, so. Oh, Thank great. you. So it's uh, 10 to the 7 solar mass kilos are resolved, and that means that the uh, star formation uh, does happen at earlier redshift and realization starts. Uh, right, it gets redshift uh, around 15. More than 20. Thanks for the question. 
Great. So uh, we've got just about time for one more if there is one. Uh, otherwise, we'll we'll move to the next part of the schedule. So I'll just give give people another few seconds. Uh, there's a raised hand. In the <laughs> Let's see. So that's boom. I'm going to click allow to talk. You should be able to talk. Um, but more, he's, he's vanished. I think he, he's. Uh... Oh, there he is. Hi. Can you hear me, Anastasia? Yes. Yeah. OK, thanks. Thanks for the great talk. I just have a question about um, the upcoming SARS um, results, which they claim that they don't detect the signal that the edge is detected, right? I'm just wondering what is your take on that in terms of the theory side and what do you think uh, would be the role of HERA to fill in the gap between SARS and edges results? Thanks for the great question. Uh, so in terms of astrophysical explanations, I would be more comfortable if it's not uh, approved, right? If uh, edges results turn, turns to be an artifact or artifact of their say foreground modeling, because it's really hard to explain it in terms of astrophysics. One needs either a thousand times brighter quasars at rate of 20 than what we have today. And that's, uh, that's very hard, right? Uh, because first dark matter, First black holes were much smaller than today and much fewer. So that would be hard to explain. Uh, or one needs um, some exotic radio mechanisms uh, such as neutrino that decay and produce radio photons or dark matter annihilation, which is also not mainstream models. Uh, or this dark matter cooling, which is very constrained uh, scenario. So if we want to have a standard astrophysical picture, then uh, Sarah's results would be more comforting. Uh, the paper somehow takes very long to go through the review process and uh, I understand that, I, I, well, I haven't seen it, so. Um, and uh, the role of Hera would be, so the, at the moment, as uh, Stefan, I hope, will mention his talk, uh, Hera, uh, lower redshift Hera band, so redshift 8 uh, and 10. They are constrained in different types of models than what edges uh, would measure because it's a different redshift regime. And the signals that peak in the edges band would be already low in the Hera band uh, by the natural evolution of uh, the universe in these models. So we would need something at higher redshift, so like Hera high redshift band, uh, once it's operational, uh, to probe power spectrum at those times to have the more direct constraint on these models. And then if this models uh, or the, this uh, range is probed by Hera or another instrument, uh, we can directly address this uh, power, uh, this uh, parameter range as probed by edges and see if signals that edges detects, but their uh, corresponding power spectra, are they supposed to be already detectable? Are they within HERA sensitivity or not? So that would be very important to get uh, a view of inter interferometers on that window as well. Excellent, thanks very much. Um, so I think we should move on. So, so thanks again, Anastasia. Th thanks for a really good talk. Um, Thank you very much for in inviting me. No, th thanks again. So um, I'm going to do two things now. I'm going to pop a link in the chat. So if you want, you can use YouTube to watch this pre-recorded video. It's from uh, Danny Jacobs, who's going to give um, a, a, effectively an, an overview of the HERA experiment as a whole. Um, so you can use the YouTube link if you like, but I'm also going to stream it um, over Zoom, which I hope will work reasonably well. But um, it, it, it's kind of your choice, uh, which, whichever works better for you technologically. So I've just popped a link in the chat if you want that, but I'll, I'll also um, share my screen now and uh, hope, hope it, it works nicely. Hello, Danny Jacobs here from Arizona State University. 
I'm going to tell you today a little bit about um, the Hera telescope and um, what it looks like and what it's designed to do and uh, some of the details uh, about um, our data analysis. But mostly a lot of that will be left to future talks. So um, I'll give you an overview and then we'll break it down from there. Um, so Hera is a uh, large collaboration with about uh, 100 and so people scattered around the world uh, with many institutions in the United States and uh, Europe uh, and uh, collaborators in South Africa. There are a number of uh, supporting partners, the main ones being the National Science Foundation in the United States and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, as well as a, as many of the institution partners as well. A lot of people working really hard. Um, as you'll probably already have heard, the, uh, the big picture scientifically is to uh, measure the, uh, the 21 centimeter line from neutral hydrogen. And this is something that is uh, available throughout the cosmic timeline. And there's lots of different science cases for, for doing, for looking at different epochs. And so the context that we're building this array in is one where uh, we're going after a very specific range of uh, redshifts where uh, where you can do specific kinds of astrophysics and cosmology but there's a there is a wider range and there's a uh, the the uh, vigorous um, community of, of instrument builders and uh, there is going after a lot of different interesting things at different epochs Hera specifically is really targeting this time period during the uh, onset of the first stars and into reionization so the the last gasp of neutral gas in the universe when stars are done. Uh, and the, this, it observationally sits at an interesting point between uh, the cosmic microwave background and, uh, and large uh, optical and infrared observatories. So we can, we can look for overlaps cosmologically between things like uh, the CMB probes and, um, and astrophysically things like um, JWST. Specifically, we're zooming in a little bit. Um, you probably have seen a light cone like this already. This is a map 2D simulation showing a slice through the universe of hydrogen and what it might look like. Uh, it's in uh, it's it, it's in absorption. It's blue, and, and when it's in emission, it's red. And you can see that there's there's uh, quite a lot going on. They're different depending on what epoch you look at. And Hera specifically is targeting uh, this uh, this time this the end of the time this, this time period from redshifts about 14 to to six, um, and specifically looking at uh, the fluctuations. So uh, on the top there, you can see this slice uh, in, in two dimensions, and then the bottom is the, the globally average signal where uh, there is uh, additional information to be found. Later, uh, we'll be, in fact, uh, currently upgrading Hera to uh, phase two, which will add a significant uh, uh, redshift extension to target that, uh, that deep trough there, that, um, that blue area, uh, where we think that there's further uh, interesting things to go after. Specifically, what we're measuring is the, uh, the power spectrum. So the, the power spectrum is um, as a probe of variation on various, um, as a function of size scale, basically. What you're seeing here is a, a simulation showing uh, the birth of ionization, ionized bubbles on the left and, um, and a power spectrum on the right where uh, K modes uh, that are small, the, uh, on the X axis, uh, 0.1 K modes, there's about 10 meg, uh, megaparsecs in size and then all the way up to one. So you've got, the largest things in, in the on the left, and you can see as the ionized bubbles really get big, that 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 small K power grows, and then the whole thing drops away. And so this is a, this is a fully 3D probe. We can we're measuring the the 3D universe as at different slices in, in redshift, but we can uh, we can look at it as it evolves too. So we get this uh, power spectrum as a function of K and redshift. That's the thing we're trying to measure. And this is what uh, we can compare against models to, to infer uh, physics going on underneath. The um, specifically what Hera is going after is, uh, like I said before, these redshift ranges that are that are roughly between six to fourteen, and then and then maybe hopefully extending out to as high as twenty. And if you look at the sensitivity that um, that that uh, we're attempting to put on the sky, it's this this line here is a function of. Uh, as a function of redshift. So pick pick a mode from that plot that I showed you before, power spectrum evolving as a function of, of redshift. Pick a single K mode 
and, uh, and look at it as a function of redshift, and you get this plot here. And you can see uh, that uh, depending on the models, I mean, I've got a couple, the orange and the, and the, and the, and the red, you can, uh, you can see that there's quite a large difference depending on, on what's going on in the early universe. So uh, the, uh, the kinds of sensitivities we're hoping to put on these models is on the range of 30 sigma and higher, depending on the model, which is, which is um, uh, uh, mostly due to the large collecting area that we're adding to the picture, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, so this is a, this is a one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is just um, the various power spectra that people have measured. So what ha how have we been doing? This is the context that we're in right now without any uh, uh, deep pair of measurements on here yet. So these are these are different power spectrum limits. These are uh, uh, measures uh, upper limits on the on the on the power. The, the power can't be any higher than this according to these measurements. And uh, there's a bunch of them here from various telescopes like the NWA and uh, GMRT and um, and the Paper Telescope, which is a precursor to HERA and, and LOFAR. And you can see that there's a general trend where um, rising noise as you go to smaller scales means uh, that power spectra are generally tilted up with, uh, with, uh, with K. Um, and that there's also different modes where there's more sensitivity, and that has to do with the spectrum sampling function, which we can talk about more in detail later. Um, so Hera is aiming to put lower limits than this on on the on the on the board, and you can see we're all right around you know 10 to the four, a little bit few times 10 to the three in these units. Uh, so Hera itself is. Um, is a targeted experiment, which means that it's really aimed at just this specific science question. We're not aiming to do other science at lower frequencies, although um, accidents do happen. Uh, this is uh, this is what it looks like. What it looked like a little while ago, anyway. This is a it's it's uh, it's a collection of 14 meter dishes, all packed really tightly together. You can see them there, sort of going off into the distance, and they uh, they each one has a, a feed at the center, which is hung. From the from three poles, just just like Arecibo was, the uh, the 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 dish itself is is a, made of low cost materials. It's made out of PVC and uh, and uh, and uh, wood and and things like that. The um, mesh itself is laying there when it when it presses down on that PVC, it hangs nicely in a in a parabola like shape, and uh, focused on that on that feed at the top. The uh, the net. The net size of it is uh, such that it adds up to being about um, a fifth of point. What did I say? Point oh five square kilometers. So a hefty amount. Almost you can almost start using that unit, um, and uh, it's uh, being built in South Africa, like I said before. So you can see there, it's in the in the desert. Uh, the um, the UV configuration, the 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 number of size scales that we measure. This is a typical metric that uh, radio interferometers use. Um, to estimate how good a reconstruction, sky reconstruction they can do is, is very good because it's very dense. The, the dishes are all right next to each other. And that means we, um, we sample all of the scales ranging from the scale between two dishes out to the largest array. It's a, basically, it's a fully sampled aperture. It isn't a perfect uh, situation though because there are gaps between the dishes and that is one of its limitations. The, um, one of the other things that we've done is made the array redundant where each of those, because it's a grid shape, because they're all packed together right next to each other, you get the same baseline many times, and that lets us do things like calibration and um, and uh, average together those baselines before we do anything else, which improves our signal to noise. The um, the, uh, the the kind of coverage that, that this gives us is uh, is is what brings the sensitivity. So. Just roughly speaking, this kind of sensitivity gives you constraints that look kind of like this. So this is a this is a typical set of power spectra that you might imagine uh, some some uh, some model predictions, and these are our really rough early uh, sensitivity projections for those. And, and nothing has really changed to really um, uh, uh, to really alter this picture too terribly much. We're expecting to be able to constrain lots of different models depending mainly on our ability to, to constrain and remove foregrounds. So we've divided the project up into two phases. The first phase used, uh, the, used a lot of the hardware left over from the paper experiment, 
uh, specifically those um, those feeds which were taken out of the uh, paper dishes which you can see there in the background and put hanging over the dish the dishes and, and we used the existing uh, front end system and the digitizers to build a first draft array if you will using about 70 antennas the main limitation being just the existing cables didn't allow us to do more antennas than that even though we had more we, had, we did have more feeds um, these are some of the technical details if you're interested um, it ended up being a coverage uh, frequency coverage of about 100 to 200 megahertz which corresponds to a redshift range of 13 to five and a half which covers the the full uh, likely range uh, that reionization is likely to take place in and it was used to observe and to test new um, new upgrades new upgraded hardware and um, uh, in the uh, in the first couple of years of the project uh, more recently we moved on to a phase two phase two adds um, a different broadband antenna totally new feed you can see there the um, those shiny big feeds hanging there those are now sensitive all the way down to 50 megahertz which gives us coverage up to 20 20 something in redshift depending on where exactly you draw the line it also adds quite a few more channels uh, which lets us do a better job projecting interference and, and things like that we've uh, completely replaced the correlator and and the analog front end basically the only thing that's the same are the dishes here's a comparison so the uh the left is the phase one which has that uh, narrower band dipole structure hanging up there and then the, the, on the right is the is the vivaldi just for for comparison the uh we've been building out since about 2015 when um so there's a the picture of uh um of the south africa site from uh from orbit there on the on the right is the meerkat telescope and there on the left is uh is hera uh, down there it's a it's, it's on a circle it's been carved out for us and uh, the build out started in 2016 with a small array of 19 dishes in 2017, we added a 60 new dishes, still using those old feeds. Um, in 2018, we began testing the Hera system upgrade, the phase two upgrade with the new uh, RF stuff. And in 2019, we added um, a bunch of new dishes. And, um, and then soon after that, COVID hit. Uh, but um, we were able to continue building and uh, the array is now is now complete. Uh, the only thing left are a few outriggers that we plan to add later. So as we did this, we also observed. So here is a, here's a rough timeline. We every year would turn on the array when the um, when the sky was right and uh, observe with whatever dishes we had. And as we added more dishes, things got better. What you're seeing there is a drift scan from our first season, real first season of data, which was observed in 2017. So the sky is just scanning past Harris sits there looking straight up turning as the earth turns and um, you can see uh, the sources um, mostly extragalactic sources moving on overhead so we collected a good chunk of data a few hundred nights uh, and um, and have been uh, especially through the COVID years when access to site is limited uh, really digging into that and and building up our, our analysis capabilities which is uh, mostly what you're going to hear about today from um, from Josh Dillon and, and Nick Kern to come after. And then uh, later, and then which all of that analysis led to a um, data release and uh, a set of result papers, uh, which have been used to provide an, an initial uh, scientific interpretation, which Andre Messenger will talk about. So um, uh, I'll just give a really quick top level overview of, of that stuff and then let them handle the details. One of the things that we really targeted with the um, with this array uh, upgrade was the reduction of systematics. So um, just to, to give you a kind of a, a view into this, the uh, on the left is a um, is a power spectrum. This is in P of K units. So to get the delta squared units, you have to multiply by K cubed, and everything tilts up. These are much more useful units to use for looking at data. And you can see that the, 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 there's a central peak, and that's where we expect foregrounds, which are smooth spectrum, to live. Um, and uh, outside of that, there's, there's bumps. And those bumps turn out to be related to systematics uh, reflections and, and uh, cross-coupling within our cable system. And you can see here that, um, that uh, an example of application of a, um, 
a filtering scheme that uh, that removes these. These uh, Nick will talk more about this in, uh, in his time. That's one of the things that that's been accomplished. The second one is is really understanding how to calibrate an array like this. But the redundant array, you can you can um, you can use the fact that you are measuring the same baseline many times. Um, so the uh, that gives you an additional way to calibrate your. It doesn't it doesn't actually um, it doesn't solve all your problems. And in fact, redundancy in some cases adds them. And Josh Dillon will talk about this more later. Uh, but it really lets you see what's going on when you have a limited number of, of antennas. So given those some of those those tools, we were able to uh, produce a, an internal data set, which we then took to a power spectrum. Uh, when you do that, you have to pick which data you're going to use. The um, main two questions are which frequencies, uh, meaning which redshifts, and which parts of the sky. So we uh, did a careful down select on the basis of what we knew about uh, the, 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 those, the, the flagging going on and, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, Nick will tell us a little bit more about, about that. But on the right there, you can see a map of the sky and the stripe that Hera makes as it, as it draws across. And uh, we picked out a couple of, of local sidereal times that mapped, to, uh, that mapped to quiet chunks of the sky. The idea being uh, the signal is cosmological. You can look for it in any direction. It should be the same roughly in any direction. And so we um, pick a few, and then they ought to be the same. Uh, we recorded data uh, with uh, this smaller array, like I said before, and, and um, uh, Nick will tell us about that. And then we did some calibration uh, tricks where we, for example, tried to uh, emphasize the spectral smoothness of, of the solutions, and Josh will tell us about that. Uh, one thing that they might not tell us about because we don't have time is the, um, the fact that one of the things that we, we did when we were um, reducing, uh, trying to check, pick which times, which parts of the sky we were going to look at, is we noticed that one really specific part of the sky had a very odd um, high, uh, high, 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 um, it made a bump in the power spectrum in an odd place, and, and it turns out, um, and, and maybe we can talk about this later, that it, that it uh, was it was only in the polarization part of the um, part of the the analysis, and that meant that um, it was almost certainly, and it was a pulsar. So we we saw an object, which is pretty cool. Um, so this all led to a, a set of power spectra in different redshift bins and and sky locations, which. Um, look like this, and, and you can see that most of them are, are generally error bars that go through zero, which suggests that they are not, in fact, seeing anything. So we interpreted this as an upper limit. Not all of them are. Um, this is why having multiple skies uh, that are independent is useful. Nick will explain how we interpreted this. Um, this leads, leads to a, a limit. So this is the similar plot like I showed you before. You have different power spectrum limits. Um, and then on the bottom, you can now see some model, some example models where we're trying to get to, and uh, the new result from Hera is the, uh, the the pink the pink triangles there. So those are pretty low, and we're hoping to do still better in the future uh, with uh, just with, with a lot more data that we that we have in the can. Um, just to, as a point of comparison, you can see here what the the power spectrum looks like. So now we have redshift as color, and uh, you can, these are all the data points, not just not just one. You can see that they some some of the bins are lower than others. One thing I do want to mention is this is the Harris site, which is in South Africa, like I said before. Um, they have, um, like everyone else, uh, been impacted by COVID, and they uh, continue to. Um, do amazing work on site. You can see that they're they've got um, uh, they've been they fared. If you look at the the case rates, they've fared pretty well. Um, if you look though at the at the death rate, it's it's a different story. And they've 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 had a hard time of it, about as bad as any of us. And and at times when everyone else was was or most most everyone else was doing okay. So um, they've continued to do. Um, uh, really great work on site building through this whole thing uh, without any of us being able to go there for 18 months. We were unable to go to site, push a button, fix anything. Um, and uh, that's uh, it's a real testament to their uh, to their stick to itiveness and uh, and and uh, resourcefulness that we were able to get the all the dishes built and get all of the, the feeds assembled and and, and um, 
and get everything um, and do a lot of a lot of amazing remote debugging work. We've really learned how to do things remotely, not just not just Zoom recordings. Uh, so uh, all this data that we'll be talking about for the rest of today is available online um, on uh, our website there, reionization.org. The, uh, the data release includes all the power spectra and uh, some, and uh, there's a, also a memo series with detailed notes about the data reduction and uh, a lot of the work that went into the background. I should also um, say that there are a number of supporting papers uh, which give even more detail about our um, analysis process, validation process, and uh, and some of the other things that have gone into an error bar calculation, that sort of thing. So um, I will be on later to see you all during the uh, question period once I have woken up. Thank you for your time. Great. So um, that was Danny's talk. Um, as he just mentioned, he will be online later for the Q&A. If you do have questions, um, we, we will leave those until later, but feel free to already ask them while, while they're fresh in your mind and we'll, we'll keep them to one side. Or um, you, you should also feel free to pop them in that Google document uh, that was linked from the website that I put in the chat earlier. So next, I'm going to queue up um, another pre-recorded talk from Josh Dillon. Um, and I'll, uh, as before, I'll pop the link in the chat. There you go. You should have that in the chat now. Uh, but also, I'll live stream it. And then immediately after this, we have lunch. So we're, we're running a few minutes late. Um, but after lunch, we will be resuming at 1 p.m. So I'll, I'll mention all this again after Josh's talk is finished. Um, but, but that's the, um, the, the outline of things. Okay, so I'll just share the screen again, and we can get going with Josh's talk, which is about 30 minutes long. Hi, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to thank all the organizers for putting this together and for giving us an opportunity to showcase all the hard work that a, a huge number of people across the, across the collaboration have been doing to produce these upper limits that we're going to be talking about today. So I've been tasked to talk about HERA calibration and analysis, which is a, a broad topic and a bit of a vague one, but in general, when we think about calibration analysis, we're talking about the process by which we're reducing this vast quantity of interferometric data to something much more manageable and maintaining high data quality. So before I get into the details of how we actually approach that problem, let me go into talk about some of the background. So the key problem in 21 centimeter cosmology, as you've heard perhaps many times before, are foregrounds. So between us and the, and the hydrogen out in the early universe, uh, there are these astrophysical uh, foregrounds from our galaxy and other galaxies that are something like four to five orders of magnitude larger than the cosmological signal we're looking for. And their separability is in part dependent on the fact that the synchrotron foregrounds are smooth spectrum, whereas the interferometric signal is not. So in practice, how do we do that separation? Well, one way to think about that separation is to think about uh, how we actually measure the power spectrum, which is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But in general, when we think about the power spectrum in a theoretical sense, we think about the fluctuations as a function of k, the, uh, Fourier, the Fourier analog to distance in cosmology. But in practice, when we make these measurements, we actually split up that k-axis into k-parallel and k-perpendicular. Those are Fourier modes along the line of sight and perpendicular to the line of sight. When we do, we find something we call the window. So the window is defined uh, on the left and the right by the angular extent, those are the largest modes you can measure, and the angular resolution of the instrument. And likewise, at the top and the bottom by the frequency resolution and the intrinsic foregrounds, which dominate that low, uh, low k parallel or the smooth line of sight modes. But there's also this thing we call the wedge, which is an important uh, contributing factor to the region where we cannot uh, effectively measure the 21 centimeter signal. And to understand the wedge, it actually helps to understand a little bit about the basics of interferometry itself. So what does HERA actually measure? So each dish in HERA just looks straight up. 
It has a roughly 10 degree beam full width half max, which is you know about 400 full moons. Uh, and as it looks straight up, it measures quantities in that field of view, which we call visibility. So these are Fourier modes on the sky. And mathematically, what that means is that we're measuring the integral over the beam times the sky times a Fourier factor, which depends on frequency and where you are in the sky, but also on the length of your baseline vector, which is the pair of antennas that go into the measurement. Fundamentally, every measurement is from a pair of antennas. So what we're effectively measuring is an interference pattern on the sky. That's what this Fourier mode is. So we're looking at something that looks like this. And in particular, uh, short baselines measure lazy modes on the sky, whereas uh, longer, uh, longer baselines will measure very fine modes on the sky. That's what you get from this phase factor B dot R. Uh, and so one way to think about this wedge space again is that K perpendicular is effectively baseline length. The longer the baseline length, the finer the modes perpendicular line of sight you're measuring. And likewise, K parallel, uh, because frequency maps to distance, the further away the redder you are, the lower frequency you are. The Fourier transform of distance is k parallel, and the Fourier transform of frequency is time delay. So k parallel is effectively time delay. And in that space, that delay versus baseline length, now it makes more sense that we have this wedge, which is set by the maximum possible light travel time uh, time delay along the baseline, which is the length of the baseline divided by the speed of light. And so the idea of Hera is to focus as much sensitivity as we can at the short baselines where there is less wedge contamination. We want to really focus our sensitivity where we don't have to work as hard to, to remove foregrounds. So working outside the wedge is, is, a, is a strategy of, of managed ignorance, which is very much the, the Hera strategy. Uh, we're trading some sensitivity, perhaps, or some ability to image for, uh, for a robust path to detecting the 21 centimeter signal. Now, one of the challenges to working with the, with the strategy of foreground avoidance is, of course, that we also need to calibrate. So we don't just measure those visibilities on the sky. Every visibility we measure is complicated by an antenna-dependent quantity, uh, which is this gain, which is also a frequency-dependent quantity, for every pair of antennas. And so every antenna has its own uh, unique band pass, which then manifests in the observed visibilities. And this is a term that we need to calibrate out and understand quite precisely. So Hera's configuration was designed to be calibrated using redundancy. The idea is that different pairs of antennas here in the green and here in the pink, for example, are measuring the same separation on the sky. They should be measuring the same true visibility, but of course they have different gains. And through that, we can actually use that constraint, which I'll talk more about in a bit, to calibrate out all, almost all of the unknowns in this problem. So we designed Hera for both high sensitivity to short baselines and redundant calibratability and dense sampling in the UV in the baseline space or UV space for those familiar with interferometry. So if we look at, for example, at the uh, at the baselines that we're measuring and how often we measure them, if we go into the core here, if we zoom in, we're measuring these very, very frequently over and over again, we're measuring the same modes. And also because we've done this split of the core, we get both these intersector and intrasector uh, baselines, the high sensitivity ones are, are the intrasector, and this gives us a substantially uh, more ability to uh, to map and to discriminate between different systematics if, if um, a, as we push forward and as we build out to the full array. So, as I said, Hera was it was uh, designed to be calibrated using the resonance uh, baselines, and we can do this all without an explicit sky or instrument model. And the idea behind that is as follows. So we are measuring these visibilities and we're interested really in what are the true visibilities. The gains are nuisance parameters. So just looking at the Hera core, when we finish it, it'll be 320 antenna gains. And there's uh, 1,500 unique visibilities, unique separations between pairs of antennas. But the total number of numbers that are measured is 51,000. So this is a vast overdetermined system of equations. And as is often the case with a vast overdetermined system of equations, the goal is to minimize chi-square. So we're trying to minimize the difference between what we observe and some model for our observation, which is the unique visibilities and the gains. And we can minimize that relative to, uh, you know, in a noise-weighted sense, 
we can try to come up with sort of the best possible uh, explanation of our data, which is a, a way to solve for all of these gains and unique visibility simultaneously. And in the simulation, this works really well. Not only do we get back the level of precision that we expect given the imp you know, input noise and in simulation, but we can actually quantify uh, the distribution of values of this high squared parameter and understand not just that the the calibration looks like we're getting the right answers on average, but also the distribution of calibration parameters appears correct as well. So how does this look on real data? Well, uh, so far it seems like the redundant calibration and foreground avoidance approach are working quite well with real pair data. So for example, uh, here is a, is a set of real HERA measurements. These are what we call waterfalls as frequency on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. And what we see here is that as a function of, uh, you know, in general, these are all measuring the same baseline, the same separation on the ground, and they should therefore look the same. So we're looking at the phase of this quantity because the visibility is complex. Obviously, they're not all the same. So first things first, we need to flag out the bad baseline, uh, the bad antennas. Antenna 50 never works, so that one's gone. And now we're going to impose that redundancy constraint. So these all look completely different, and we're going to solve for a relatively small number of parameters, and all of a sudden, these all look pretty close to the same. They're not exactly the same. There's some differences in noise, and there are going to be a little bit of non-redundancies as well, which we'll talk about. Um, but it does make these things look way more similar than they did before. So next we mask out frequency, uh, radio frequency interference and the band edges, which is a whole other, uh, the radio frequency interference masking is a whole other topic, which I'd be happy to talk about it at the uh, discussion later this afternoon or, or offline if people are interested. But there's one final step here, which is that we need to perform an absolute or sky reference calibration. And to do that, and the reason we need to do that is because redundant calibration, despite this being this vast overdetermined system of equations, is actually underdetermined as well. Uh, and it's underdetermined in the sense that there are a number of degeneracies, which are things that you can change about the very parameters, the gains and the visibility solution uh, parameters that ch don't, don't change chi-square. So the most obvious one of those is that if you take all of the gains and you multiply it by a prefactor, say A, and you take those visibility solutions and you divide them by A squared, you've completely left the product G, G I, G, J, V, I, J uh, unchanged. And as a result, you, have, you haven't changed chi squared, but there's this degeneracy, this degree of freedom that needs to be addressed because we want to know what is the overall gain scale of the array. And so to solve for those last two degrees of freedom, we need to actually use a sky model. So we, were, we got pretty far without a sky model, but there's a last few degrees of freedom that we need one. So here, Nick really led the way on actually imaging with Hera, which is not designed to do, but can do well enough. Uh, a number of different fields. Here, uh, here we're seeing the stripe of constant declination that Hera can map. And we looked at three different fields and three different sets of gleam sources. That's from the MWA gleam catalog. And here's an example of what our calibrated data looks like compared to the model multiplied by a model of the primary beams that are sources, and it looks like we're measuring things to substantially better than 10% uh, accuracy in the overall flux scale. So we're able to, to solve for those last few degrees of freedom using that sky model. So this, of course, raises a question which, which I've already brought up a little bit, which is what if the array isn't perfectly redundant? And this is a problem we looked at in simulations with my uh, former student, Naomi O'Rose, who was an undergraduate at Berkeley. And what she and I did is that we simulated HERA with a number of, of parameterized non-redundancies. So we looked at position errors, for example, on the sort of uh, less than a centimeter to 10 centimeter level, and pointing errors, and beam size errors. And with no redundancy errors, when you measure the uh, when you measure the foregrounds which is really the only the term we were interested in, in here um, and do this calibration with no redundancy the calibration works perfectly as I said before and there's this very clean separation between the window and the wedge where here I'm showing on the right the uh, the place where the where the signal is the equal to the window the the foregrounds and where the signal is 10 times larger than the foreground so you can think of that as like a 10% bias. Uh, and 
And so the cosmological signal on the left here has the largest uh, amplitude at low K. And low K perpendicular has the lowest noise because that's where the densest packing of baselines is, smaller, the shortest baselines. And what we find is that non-redundancy, when we add in position and beam errors, contaminates that region of, of Fourier space, the low K perpendicular and low K, which is the highest signal to noise. Uh, and this is really this is really a big problem. This is not just losing a uh, a big portion of the way of the EOR window, but it's losing the most important portion of the EOR window, which is uh, which is really a problem. So to understand that, um, we need to figure out why that happens and then what we can do to mitigate that effect. And there turns out to be a few different ways we can mitigate it. So as I said before, redundant based on calibration is all about having this large system of equations, this overdetermined system of equations where you have all of these different variables. And so what happens is the following. If you have non-redundancy on all of the visibilities that you've measured, then you're going to get chromatic errors on the long baselines. Remember, the longest baselines were the ones that had the uh, most wedge in them, so to speak. They went up the furthest in K parallel. So they have the, the most chromaticity. And those chromatic errors on the longest baselines, of course, there's chromatic errors on the short ones too, but they're less important because they don't go up as high, you know, they don't have as much wedge in them, so to speak. Those chromatic errors on the longest visibilities affect the antenna calibrations across the board. And if you don't do anything about that, that then leaks foregrounds uh, to the shortest baselines. You get, you're adding chromaticity to the gains that wasn't actually there in your simulation. And that's the big one of the biggest uh, things we need to avoid because we need to preserve that separability of foregrounds from uh, the 21 centimeter signal and to do that we need to preserve the intrinsic smoothness of the array if it is in fact has an intrinsically smooth instrument response. And so one thing we could do for example is just not use those long baselines. Instead of using all you know 1500 unique visibilities we looked at using just the inner 187 so something like six separations from the center here. And what they found is that that was one strategy that basically got us back the vast majority of the EOR window. So just by avoiding using those long baselines, we're not introducing these chromatic errors and we're actually getting back the, most of what we, what we lost. So that's not the only way. We can think of other ways, and, and we have another way I'll talk about in a bit, for avoiding that problem. But uh, the, the good news is that we, because we can understand it, uh, we can predict when it will happen and we can take steps to avoid it. So this was all simulation, but the real question, of course, is how redundant is HERA? Well, it's not, uh, to, to be perfectly honest. And we can quantify that because we can write down chi-squared per degree of freedom, and we can do this along a number of different dimensions of the array, but this tells us you know, we can quantify very precisely how discrepant is our instrument at the level of the noise from perfect redundancy or what we'd expect from perfect redundancy given the, the noise that we have. And we can see that it is clearly discrepant from, from perfect redundancy, but it's also not that far off in the sense that the level of non-redundancy is not very big compared to the noise itself. There is a clear detection of that non-redundancy, but it's not very strong. And this is, I think, not a huge surprise, of course, because HERA is a very complicated instrument. It's not complicated in, in the sense that it's technologically sophisticated materials. You know, for the most part, obviously there's a technologically sophisticated signal chain and correlator, but the rest of HERA is PVC pipe and chicken wire mesh and telephone poles. So it's pretty hard to model chicken wire mesh and PVC pipe and telephone poles to the level of accuracy that we would need to really make this array truly redundant. Uh, and there's a lot of degrees of freedom, so to speak, in this array in the sense that you know, you can move these telephone poles around just a little bit and create all kinds of antenna to antenna variation. Not to mention that uh, if you add in coupling from antenna to antenna, this turns out to be a very complicated problem to uh, map and understand the, the, the beam, Hera's primary beam, which is itself a contributing factor to this non-redundancy. Um, the things that Naomi and I looked at, for example, was a very simplistic model compared to uh, just using an airy disk model of the primary beam, but the real primary beam is substantially more complicated. But we can start to get some hints about what's going on by digging into chi-squared, which turns out to be a very powerful statistic for understanding what's going on in the array. And what we see 
if we plot chi squared as a waterfall as a function of frequency and time structure that repeats uh, from night to night and that has some clear indication that's related to what's going on in the sky. And for example, if we take this quantity then and average it in frequency and look at it as a function of time, it appears, for example, that there are peaks and valleys in chi-squared which are related to the positions of point sources. Which is to say, when point sources are in the side lobes of the primary beam, um, they're particularly bright and you're probing regions that are probably varying more antenna to antenna, those side lobes. Uh, and so therefore, you're in a position where you can no longer measure, you know, you can no longer treat bright point sources uh, as degenerate with gain fluctuations. And actually, this is something we looked at in more depth to try to understand the extent to which this model explains what we see in the real data. And so this is something that another undergraduate student who worked with me, Max Lee, looked at uh, back in uh, summer of 2009 before we, we couldn't do these things in person. And he looked at the temporal structure of the gains instead of the, the spectral structure. And what he found as we dug in is that the same antenna over different nights had some randomness to it in terms of its gain, which we expect from noise, but also there was a clear correlation from night to night, and it seemed like there was a, an extent to which these were varying the same way every night, in a way that was sky locked or LST locked rather than uh, you know the particular time of day. And so if you take these gains and you look at the temporal power spectrum, how much fluctuations there are on different time scales, both the measure gains themselves and the me and the quote unquote intrinsic gains, which are the measure gains divided by the average over all the nights, we can see that there's actually, so it looks more consistent with noise uh, over most time scales if you take out the thing that is varying the same way, the same every day. And likewise, if you take, for example, Naomi's model, which is a simplified parameterized model of, of non-redundancy, you can actually explain precisely this effect and the sort of 30 minute to, to six hour regime, which is the non-redundancy is not just creating temporal structure, but a, spe a spectral structure, as she predicted, but also temporal structure in the calibration, which we can see pretty clearly and explains what we think we're seeing here. So this motivates, uh, you know, the idea that the gains that we're measuring on time scales that are shorter than about six hours appear to be corrupted by effects that are due to our non-redundancy and therefore are perhaps not to be trusted. And likewise, when Nick did a very similar analysis looking at the spectral structure of the gains, we saw that uh, outside of a certain delay, um, out of a certain delay modes, basically outside of about 100 nanoseconds, the very fine scale spectral structure was more likely attributable to instrumental artifacts, be they uh, cross coupling, which Nick will talk much more about, cable reflections um, at both the 20 meter length scale and 150 meter length scale. There's a number of effects here that we don't think are real in the sense that they're not real impacts on the gains themselves, although some of them might be, but in general, we think that we don't really trust our ability to measure the gains at very fine frequency scales. So both of these are inability to measure the gains at very fine time scales and ability to measure the gains at very fine frequency scales are motivating a different approach to the problem of spectral structure and temporal structure, which is uh, imparted by non-redundancy, which is to just smooth. So when we go from our redundant calibration and then solve those last few modes uh, in the middle column here with absolute calibration, and so that also makes sure that every uh, every time step, which is calibrated independently, has the same phase reference. So that's why we see this change from the redundant the left to the middle on the bottom here in the phase. But then when we go to the right, we've applied this calibration smoothing, and so we've smoothed out over the the fine scale structure, which we think is probably not real and is either noise or due to non-redundancy, and we don't trust it, so we don't want to make changes to the data that we don't trust. So, despite our non-redundancy, uh, chi-squared has been actually a really important way of helping us pick out the highest quality data, and this is a project that another student, Alex Vasquez, who was with us as part of the CHAMP program, was looking at during his summer on, on HERA. And one thing that we looked at together was this question of how to distinguish antennas based on their chi-square, their non-redundancy. And ultimately what we did is we 
pick the the antennas with the worst chi squared, so that's averaging their chi squared over all the visibilities they're involved with, and attribute that to that particular antenna. And we can see that there are clear outliers in that. So there were a handful of antennas that were much more strongly outlying than others. So we pick those. Uh, to remove. And that's how we ultimately ended up with our final list of flagged antennas. Most of the ones that were flagged were either totally dead or had particularly high chi-squared uh, or were contributing particularly strongly to the chi-squared. And so we, we wanted to maintain the highest quality data possible for upper limits. So we picked only the antennas that appeared more uh, closer to consistent with each other and with noise. And it seems to have worked pretty well because one metric for how much this non-redundancy matters is how much the fact that we're not quite measuring the same sky with with pairs of antennas that are supposed to be measuring the same sky affects the power spectrum. So we can compute this quantity, which is a, a metric of signal loss or, de or, or decoherence between two different ways of, of averaging at um, averaging the foregrounds together. And what we find is in general that decoherence is at a few percent level, which means that we don't have to um, bolster our power spectrum limits by very much to account for the possibility that there's some decoherence in the ultimate result. So that's a, another testament to our, our, our array actually being quite redundant in terms of its uh, construction, despite you know our clear measurable non-redundancy, it's not affecting the results very much. And as a result, the instrument is also looking pretty stable from day to day. So we begin integrate down so we can add days together and we can build sensitivity in that way and at this point once we have this this deeply reduced data product which is the highest quality possible that's the point where the the analysis team passed things off to the power spectrum team and in particular to nick who really led this next part of the pipeline so we built this giant pipeline that reduced the data down and we passed it off for the power spectrum estimation which we'll nick will talk about in just a few minutes uh but first I do want to talk about another effort that went on um, in part simultaneously, and that's to build confidence that the analysis is actually doing what we expect. We built this whole infrastructure for validation. And by validation, we mean we wanted to test that using simulations where we know the answer, we are getting the results that we expect. And this was a, a bootstrapping kind of iterative process where we were first testing little bits of this system so as we see as we go down this plot we're getting more and more complex because we're including more and more different parts of the um, models of the instrument and the foregrounds and the signal different visibility simulators different components of our, our systematics and then different parts of the analysis pipeline that would be tested in isolation and then all together at the end where we're testing almost the entire uh, set of things that we know could be in the data using uh, you know, entirely simulated data, and we were able to show that we get back what we expect. And so I believe Nick will talk a little bit more about some of the results of, you know, of the recovery of power spectra, but we have intermediate results as well, because we can look at how well is calibration doing on the validation data set. And the validation data set is not as redundant. We didn't build in that antenna to antenna variation, so that's one systematic that we've got to take into account, but it's also not perfectly redundant because we have this cross-coupling systematic that I'm sure Nick will talk more about in a minute. Uh, but it does, you know, we are showing that given given the systematics that we did put in, we are recovering uh, the expected high square distribution to pretty, pretty high fidelity, better than in the real data. And so then we can look at, for example, how, you know, because now we know the answer is what the gains should have been, we're seeing sort of milliradian level gains across, uh, gain errors across most of the uh, frequency range they're interested in after the calibration smoothing. It's a little bit worse at the band edges because that smoothing affects the band edges more. And likewise, we can look, for example, as of whether the measured noise in that final LST bin data, and this is LST bin simulated data, is matching the noise that we can expect. And it, and it looks like the noise is consistent within one or two percent of what we would expect. Uh, so it really does look like we are integrating down like noise. So in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to mention uh, some of the work that we've been doing that beyond the, the limit that we're going to talk about. And then, of course, Nick will go back uh, to focus on, on the limit that we're, that we're discussing today. Uh, one thing that I think should be highlighted is that this is just data from 18 nights, what we call the internal data release number two uh, from this particular season. But we actually have a full season of data here I'm showing. Uh, the, the number of antennas on each day 
during that full season of data. And it looks like after a variety of cuts, including those you know, chi-squared red cow cuts, we're seeing roughly the same number, about 40 antennas on every day, but there's still something like uh, you know, four to five times as much data available potentially. And so we really wanted to churn through all of that as well using the lessons that we learned both from analyzing um, IDR2, but also analyzing data from later seasons as we continued to commission the instrument. So we built a new, uh, one of these confusing uh, pipeline diagrams and a whole set of software that takes the data all the way to the, the LST binning. But the thing I wanted to highlight in particular that I, I, I think is particularly exciting is that we've built automated data inspection Jupyter Notebook. So every night, every major analysis step produces a Jupyter Notebook in a consistent way that we can then look for, is this analysis step working? Are the results making sense? So for example, does smooth cal look like it actually smoothed the calibration or did something go awry? And after personally inspecting about 500 of these notebooks, I, you know, I used that to figure out where the analysis had failed, which nights we just needed to throw away. And we were left with 94 nights of data with roughly a similar number of antennas to the number that we used for the upper limit that we just published. Um, so that's a big increase in sensitivity, and that's what particularly exciting. So we're now gearing up to run that same end-to-end -end simu uh, simulation and validating our pipeline, but now on the full-scale data set, so that full season of observations. And likewise, we're working on running a variety of statistical tests on the data themselves uh, to help build confidence in the analysis, to show that if you split the data in a variety of ways, it behaves like it ought to, like it were consistent with the statistics that we understand about the noise and the foregrounds. But what's exciting uh, from my perspective is that just from a pure sensitivity uh, angle, the limit could be as much as three times deeper than the one that we're presenting here today, which is really exciting because that you know the one we're presenting today is already the best upper limit in the world, and we it would represent a significant advance toward the ultimate goal of detecting the 21 centimeter power spectrum. So to sum up, as I talked about today, precision calibration is key for 21 centimeter cosmology in, particular, uh, in general and in HERA for particular. And in HERA was designed for robust calibratability, for working outside of the foreground wedge and mitigating foregrounds and being able to understand our calibration without, a, uh, without much reference to a sky model. And, uh, and to be able to, to you know, be as easily calibratable as possible. That's the key idea behind HERA while maintaining a lot of sensitivity to the 21 centimeter signal uh, by just having a huge collecting area. And the limits that we're discussing today are based on this purpose-built analysis pipeline that we've really battle-tested on both the real data, which we've pushed through this pipeline and now have pushed through a much larger data set through a very, you know, through a, uh, an iteration of that pipeline, but also on simulated data, which are trying increasingly to have all of the complexity that we see in the real world data as we, uh, as we move toward understanding every stage of our analysis and what it can do and what it does do to the data uh, in order to make sure that we really are confident in the limits because this is a vast data reduction problem and it can be quite challenging. But I'm excited to report that we've made substantial progress and we are now hard at work on these deeper limits from a full season of HERA data. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll be here at the discussion section to answer any questions folks have. So please uh, let me know and thank you again. Excellent. So um, we are going to move on to the lunch break now. So um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the recording for now and we'll come back at pretty promptly at 1 p.m. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave the, the webinar running. If you have any questions or anything you want to pop in the chat, please get, feel free to go ahead or, or keep an eye on those. But um, we'll, we'll return just, just before 1 p.m. And uh, that'll be with a talk from Nick Kern.
Hi folks, we'll get started in a couple of minutes time when it gets to 1 p.m. here. Okay, um, just want to make sure you can, uh, you can see this. Yeah, I can hear you and I can, well, I, I just saw your screen, now I don't see your screen. Okay, yeah, I just, I just, there we go. It. Okay, good. Now, now I can see you, so. Okay, very good. Right, good stuff. I'll I'll um I'll let you know when we're about to start again, and um I can give you a. Do you prefer a two or a five minute warning? Oh, the sound has gone now. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, two is fine. I can also time myself here. It's twenty five ish minutes. Is that right? Uh, yeah, twenty five to thirty. Okay, I should should be fine then. Great, thanks. Okay, we'll give it two more minutes and then we can get cracking again. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back after lunch. So um, this will start the afternoon se uh, session. So first up, we've got uh, Nick Kern, who's going to be talking about the Power Spectrum pipeline. Um, so whenever you're ready, Nick, uh, please take it away. And, and there will be a bit of time for questions after this as well. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Um, let me share my screen. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Phil um, and associates for organizing. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of the panel and discuss some of the recent limits from Hera. I'll be talking about systematics and power spectra. Um, and uh, I am an MIT fellow uh, in the Department of Physics. Okay. So I'll structure the talk in two main sections. I'll talk first about some of the challenges in signal detection. Um, and I'll frame that in terms of the, the two major paradigms with which the experiments are actually trying to make a detection, uh, known as foreground avoidance and subtraction. I'll talk about some of the systematics we're seeing in Hera phase one and what we're doing about them. Uh, and then I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about the power spectra themselves, uh, some of the data selection, I'll discuss the limits and some of the work we're doing to validate our analysis pipeline. Okay, so challenges in measuring the signal. So um, the question it's worth asking is why is measuring the 21 centimeter signal so hard? Why have we been at this now for 10, 15 plus years and, and haven't been able to do this? And one of the reasons why this is the case is what you're seeing here, which is a map of the exceedingly bright astrophysical foreground emission, <clears throat> largely coming from um, diffuse structure within the Milky Way 
uh, via non-thermal synchrotron emission largely, but also due to extragalactic radio point sources as well. Um, and it turns out that this foreground emission is something like 10 to the five, if not more, times brighter <clears throat> than the underlying 21 centimeter signal. So that sets up a delicate signal separation process. But it turns out this isn't the only problem. Um, really, the crux of the problem is that it's, it's this foreground problem combined with an a priori unknown or imperfectly understood instrumental response. And it's that combination that makes this particularly challenging. And I'll describe what that looks like from a data perspective by taking you through a tour of what the data should look like. And so this is a toy simulation of some radio data. And there's a couple of components that we know are in the data. So one are the foreground emission, which is what I just said. Um, now, one of the operating principles with our understanding of the foregrounds is because they are non-thermal in origin largely, um, they are fairly spectrally smooth. All right, and so what I'm showing you is, is a measurement of these foregrounds with uh, a, say, some kind of mock instrument. Um, now that instrument will have some amount of chromaticity in its uh, measurement process. And so what you can see here is that there is a little bit of smooth spectral structure in, in, in the spectrum here, but it's largely smooth. Um, and another way of, of stating that is to look at its Fourier transform, right? Um, so on the right here, I'm looking at the Fourier transform of the signal as a, across frequency, and that puts it into a time domain. And the fact that this signal is occupied by low Fourier modes, it's compact in Fourier space, is telling you that it's made up of very smooth sinusoids, right? Um, now it turns out that for the rest of this talk, when I talk about the power spectrum, really what I'm talking about to first order is just the square of the Fourier transform. And that's, that's the, that's the, to first order, that's the estimator that we use. Okay, so I, I'm showing you that the foregrounds are smooth, but that's not the only thing in our data. The other thing that's in our data is thermal noise. Now thermal noise is uh, spectrally uncorrelated. Uh, it's generally white and it's Gaussian distributed. Uh, and that means in Fourier space, it's generally flat, at least for the instruments that we're working with, um, it looks something like this. Uh, <clears throat> but also there is the EOR signal. Now on the left here, I've amplified the amplitude here, just so you can, you can see what it might look like. Um, what, what, you, what you'll notice is that it's highly spectrally variant. There's a lot of spectral structure here. Uh, and that is of course, <clears throat> because um, as a function of frequency, we are probing in and out of the line of sight of our observations. We're probing the inhomogeneities of the IGM as a function of redshift. And that makes it highly spectrally variant. As a consequence in Fourier space, it has broad support. It has a lot of power over a lot of Fourier modes. Um, and here's really the kicker is that the dynamic range between the peak foreground power and the, and the EOR signal intrinsically is something like 10 to the five, if not more uh, in power. Um, so that sets up this separ signal separation problem, but in Fourier space, our understanding of the foregrounds in the EOR also sets up these two major paradigms with which experiments are trying to actually make a detection and deal with the foreground. So one is known as foreground subtraction. And what that says is, is we're going to try to model the foregrounds very precisely. We're gonna model the blue curve to one part in 10 to the five, and we're going to then subtract our model from the data to reveal the underlying EOR signals down here. All right. The other paradigm is a foreground avoidance strategy. And that says, well, I don't think that I can actually model my foregrounds to one part of 10 to, 10 to the five, at least not yet. And so instead I'm going to completely throw out these low Fourier modes and I'm only going to probe the power spectrum at Fourier modes where I think the EOR is the dominant signal relative to the foreground say. Um, now, if this <clears throat> were the end of the story, we'd probably already have a detection of the signal. It turns out that systematics ruin this whole story. Um, and I'll describe what that means. So in effect, what's, what systematics do, in, in particular systematics that have spectral structure, is they, they violate the assumption that foregrounds are compact in Fourier space, and they spill their power out to um, a higher Fourier modes, and thus contaminating the region in the power spectrum where we would otherwise measure the EOR, what we call the EOR window. So some kind of spectral systematic may look like this. So it modulates the foreground signal in some spectrally variant way, 
And as a consequence, it turns this blue curve into this red curve. Um, and it, it, it spills these, this foreground power out. We call this uh, foreground leakage. And so it turns out whether or not you're pursuing a foreground subtraction or avoidance approach, you have to understand the data very precisely. Um, and that is what makes this a very hard measurement, but um, it's also what makes it um, uh, interesting as well, I'll say. So uh, for HERA, HERA is uh, an experiment that is pursuing a foreground avoidance approach, but we still need to understand uh, systematics at a very high level. And of course, there are a number of systematics that we can, <clears throat> we can discuss. Um, there's instrumental gain calibration, there's uncertainties in the primary beam, cross-coupling between antennas, reflections, and the list goes on and on. And we spent the past 10, 15 years trying to understand uh, these systematics in very fine detail. And what I'll say is that these are not particularly novel systematics for radio interferometry. The difference is that we've never had to understand them to such high precision. And this requirement has forced a, a near complete redesigning of how we analyze and reduce radio interferometric data specifically for 21 centimeter science. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways we're doing that for HERA. Okay, but to motivate that, I'll, I'll, I'll motivate that by jumping right into some of the data and, and, and telling you, describing what we see. So I'm showing you some power spectra from HERA phase one. Um, each color here uh, is a power spectrum estimate um, taken from different baselines in the array. So they, they see largely the, the same sky. And you're seeing here what we expect, which is at low Fourier modes, you see a detection of a strong foreground peak, which tapers off into a noise floor. And this black dashed line is giving you an expectation for what we expect that noise floor to be. And so you can see it's very, very consistent with the data at high Fourier modes. And the name of the game for 21 centimeter is just to integrate down and to take longer and longer uh, observations to try to measure some underlying EOR signal. So what I'm doing here is I'm just slowly integrating this data down um, with more and more time. And what you'll see is eventually um, when I integrate down uh, by a couple um, orders of magnitude, you'll see that I, I detect something coming out of this noise floor here. And in this last plot, what I did is I actually averaged the different colors together, which is a form of effective time integration. Okay, so there's a couple of key points here. A, at very high Fourier modes, we see that our data is still fairly consistent with our understanding of the thermal noise, which is good. However, in these intermediate areas, there is some kind of spectral hump. Um, and this is a systematic. Um, it is not uh, EOR signal. Um, so uh, we spent some time trying to understand what this systematic is and how to deal with it. And I'll describe um, some of the ways that we're doing that. So it turns out that this systematic can be traced back to various forms of instrumental coupling within the front end of the system. Um, and it turns out there's two ways in which we, 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 we know systematics can arise in the front end. Um, one of these ways is some kind of coupling between antennas, whether that's um, over the air or further down uh, in, in the front end system in the electronics, if there's some kind of capacitive coupling that can also cause cross coupling in our measurements, um, as well as reflections within our signal chain can cause these kinds of spurious uh, spectral structure. And so we spent some time trying to understand what this looks like for HERA. So we developed some analytic formalism for modeling these systematics. And we uh, ran some foreground simulations to try to understand the phenomenology of these systematics in the data. So what I'm showing you is a simulation of foreground emission for HERA with some of these systematics inserted into the data. And the data I'm showing you is a spectrum as a function of local observing time. Um, now in this, naive time frequency basis, it's kind of difficult to understand what's going on and how to separate these very systematics. But it turns out when you take the Fourier transform across frequency, as we did before, these things become a lot clearer. All right, so that's what I've just done here is I've taken that Fourier transform. So we're now in this delay domain. And you can see, as we expect at low Fourier modes, at low delay modes, we see this intrinsic foreground signal, but we now also see these systematics separate out uh, uh, specifically the cross coupling and this reflection systematic that I've inserted into the data. But we can do this again across this vertical time axis. So we can take a Fourier transform and put it into this 2D Fourier space. Um, and that's what the data looks like after doing that. So the foregrounds become even more compact. 
Um, the systematics also become more compact. Um, and in general, in this basis, the systematics are, are, are somewhat sparse. And so what we do is we actually model our systematics in this basis. Um, if I were to simulate what the EOR signals would look like in this basis, they would populate this range of, of the space here. And so what we do is we, we develop tailored Fourier filters to try to target these specific systematics and filter them from the data. And that's the basis for our systematic filtering uh, algorithm. And if you look at real HERA data in this 2D Fourier space, this is what it looks like. So you're seeing uh, over here, as before, this is the, the very bright foreground signals we see in the data. Um, you're now seeing across this space thermal noise, which is this noise floor. But then you see these streaks, um, which are due to these cross-coupling systematics in the data. Um, and it's somewhat hard to see from this plot, but there is a reflection systematic uh, right here. So if I apply these data models uh, to our data and I try to actually subtract these systematics, um, this is the result. So this is a, uh, uh, the same data set we were looking at before where I showed you the power spectrum was integrating down and there was this bump that came out, out of the, the, the noise floor. That's this blue curve, as, as you may recall. When I apply these systematic uh, data models and I try to actually subtract them, what you get is the orange. And so you, what we're seeing here is uh, roughly two orders of magnitude in suppression of these systematics uh, with these, with these uh, analytic data models. So this is promising. Um, and uh, this is effectively the way that we're dealing with these instrumental systematics. Um, but the question is, <clears throat> what does this look like when we use a much larger data set, when we use um, multiple nights from phase one? Uh, and that is the basis for Harris first power spectrum limits. So just to remind us, you may have seen this uh, plot before, but HERA phase one uh, was only a fraction of this full array. So phase one uh, was the array in 2017 when we uh, took observations. And at the time, the array just consisted of this lower left-hand corner. It had about 50 antennas, roughly 40 that were functional. Um, and it turns out because HERA uh, is built into the ground, it does not point uh, we don't beamform, that the parts of the sky that we observe is a stripe centered at a constant declination. And for the time of the year that we were observing with phase one data in 2017, the part of the sky that we actually observe is delineated by this solid box. Okay, So we see um, some areas of the sky where there's less foregrounds, some parts of the sky where there's more. And what we've done is we've taken that data and we've carved it out into chunks uh, fields, if you will, where we try to mitigate some of the most pernicious foreground sources. In particular, this source here, which is Fornax A, which is the brightest individual source that we, we observe, other than the galactic center. And we've also tried to carve out the galactic plane as well. So there's three fields where we're going to actually perform our power spectrum analysis. Okay, so that's the angular direction. In terms of the line of sight direction, we have 100 megahertz of bandwidth uh, for the phase one system. Um, and we've picked two spectral bands to actually perform our power spectrum analysis. And this is largely motivated by this plot here. In blue, you're seeing the relative flag occupancy after we run our RFI flagging identification algorithm. And you can see that there are some chunks of our band that are completely eaten up by RFI. And that's not, ex not entirely unexpected. Um, a lot of this is satellite communication. Um, but in the mid upper part of the band and in the low part of our band, there are two relatively clean regions that are largely free of RFI, not completely. Um, but these two parts, these two bands form uh, these two subbands that we use for power spectrum estimation. And at these frequencies uh, corresponds to redshifts of 10.4 and 7.9. So that's where we're gonna be setting our first limits. Okay, so uh, this is another demonstration of our systematic rejection algorithm, but this is now on a larger data set. And now what I'm showing you is I'm showing you power spectrum from the phase one system as a function of local observing time. And because again, HERA is a drift scan array that just scans the sky, local observing time is a proxy for the right ascension that we actually observe. So top to bottom here, we can actually carve out the distinct fields on the sky that we observe. And the, the point of what I'm trying to show you here 
is that the left panel shows the power spectrum before we apply our systematic filtering, and the right is after. Um, and so you see the systematic filters, it cleans up a lot of this high delay or high Fourier mode structure. But the other thing to notice is that it makes the transition from the foreground dominated region to the noise uh, dominated region much sharper. Um, and that's an, a, a, an added benefit of our systematic filters. And I, I can discuss that later if people are, are interested. Um, but one thing to notice is that the total uh, observed foreground power in each one of these fields is not the same. That's because we're looking at different parts of the sky. And the way in which you can gauge how strong the foregrounds are in that field is by looking at the, the peak foreground power in each one of these fields. And what, what you'll notice is that field one, this top field here, observes the least amount of foreground emission, just because it's, it's looking at a part of the sky where there isn't as much foreground structure. And that's, we're going to come back to uh, what impact that has on the power spectrum in a bit. But before I show you the power spectra, I'd like to um, plot the power spectra in a slightly different way that highlights some of the, um, the, uh, the things that we've done with our analysis. So what I'm doing now is I'm showing you the, uh, the spherically averaged power spectra on a 1D basis. But I've normalized for each field, I've normalized by the peak observed foreground power at the zero width delay mode or zero width Fourier mode here. So it, really what I'm showing you is the power spectrum in terms of its dynamic range with the measured foreground power. And what you're finding is, again, exactly what we would hope to find and expect, which is you have the strong foreground power and it bottoms out onto a noise floor. Uh, and this is after applying our systematic filters and, and all of that goodness. And what you see is that this noise floor bottoms out to something like 10 to the nine in, in power relative to that peak foreground emission. And this is kind of highlighting the approach that Hera is taking to measuring the EOR signal, which is not so much foreground subtraction, but foreground containment in, in Fourier space. Um, and the fact that you're seeing 10 to the nine uh, in dynamic range in power with respect to this noise floor is saying that both the instrument itself and in the the process of measuring the signal, as well as our analysis pipeline that we've applied to the data, is able to contain that power to these low Fourier modes at one part in 10 to the 9. Now we're going to need to go a little deeper to actually measure the EOR, but this is a very neat spec for the performance of both the instrument and our analysis pipeline. Uh, and my understanding, my guess is that this is unprecedented. I don't know because it's not often that other experiments plot their data in this in this limit, but um, this is um, very high dynamic range for an EOR experiment. Okay, so this is what the implication is for the actual measured power spectra. Uh, and this is for band two uh, for each one of these fields. And you'll notice a couple of things. So again, this black dashed line is showing you the expectation of the thermal noise. And you're seeing that a lot of these points look consistent with thermal noise. Um, some of them don't, particularly field two um, it's very clear that we're detecting some kind of systematic, and that systematic is extending all the way out even to high K. But to a large extent, particularly in field one, um, a lot of these points are roughly consistent with, with uh, thermal noise. And uh, in, in the actual paper, we, we go to um, some pains to statistically quantify that um, consistency. And specifically for field one, it turns out that the points above K of 0.4, roughly, these are largely consistent with thermal noise. There's not a lot of evidence to suggest that they're not, with perhaps the minor exception of, of, this, of these guys here. But for the points that uh, below of K of 0.4, there is some marginal evidence to suggest that we're making some marginal de de uh, detection of a systematic. Um, so that's interesting. Um, the fact that the data are roughly consistent with noise tells us that we can in probably integrate down even deeper a little bit. Um, and that will help us, A, reduce the limits, but also uh, understand the systematics a little better. Um, and as I think Josh mentioned earlier, uh, that is what we are actively working on now. But um, with these limits, um, it turns out that you'll see that field one is providing the best limit. And that is largely because what we said before, which is that field one sees the lowest total foreground emission. If you look at field three, um, you'll notice that it's similar in the sense that the data are roughly consistent with the thermal noise, but there's this uh, tail 
that just starts a little sooner and it's a, it's a little higher. Um, now this is leakage from the, the foreground emission coming out uh, into the EOR window. And the reason why we're seeing it more in field three is largely because the foregrounds are just brighter. Whereas in field one, it's dimmer. And so that tail might be here, but it's just below the thermal noise here, just barely. So yeah, that's why field one, we're seeing the best limits. And in the context uh, of the state of the field right now, those limits look something like this. Um, so this, these are showing the, you the upper limits on the power spectrum as a function of redshift. Um, the Hera limits that we've just set are in pink. And what you're seeing is that redshift of 10.4, they're roughly consistent with existing limits from LOFAR. Uh, but at redshift eight, it's a significant improvement uh, by over an order of magnitude in sensitivity. Uh, again, we still have a little ways to go before we reach these fiducial theoretical models of the EOR, but we are able to say something interesting about the IGM um, with these new limits. And Andre will talk uh, a little bit later about what exactly uh, Hera is telling us about the IGM. Okay, <clears throat> so before I wrap up in the next couple minutes here, I'd like to highlight one of the efforts I mentioned before, which has been a, a large effort on behalf of many people in the Hera collaboration, uh, but I want to highlight a couple of the people here in the lower left, which have uh, have led this analysis, which is the development of an independent validation pipeline for Hera. And this is particularly important as we in continue to set deeper and deeper limits, and we use more and more sophisticated tools for trying to mitigate systematics we need to have a better understanding of that pipeline and whether or not we're inadvertently suppressing cosmological signal, which uh, is not something we, we want to do. So this is giving you a high level schematic of this pipeline. Um, it starts with a number of uh, different kinds of EOR models, different kinds of foreground models, uh, an understanding of the, uh, of the, the HERA uh, primary beam that gets pushed through a couple of different for, uh, visibility simulators we inject realistic systematics into the data that look like Hera systematics. And then we push that mock data set through the Hera pipeline or a version of the Hera pipeline, uh, which is both the analysis and the power spectrum pipeline. And we try to understand if the end result looks like what we, we know we put in. And that's kind of the basis for this comparison. And I'll show you a demonstration of what some of this mock data look like. and. Um, so what I'm showing you here on the left is actual phase one data. The top is this uh, local observing time, this LST versus frequency space. The right is our data simulation. And you know, there's, there's some differences you can spot, of course. There's this overall kind of broad amplitude offset here on the left. Um, but we've worked fairly hard to try to get the, some of the details right. And so on the bottom, I'm showing you this 2D Fourier representation of both the data and the simulation. And what you're seeing here, again, you're seeing thermal noise, which is what permeates the space. You're seeing bright foreground emission in the middle, and you're seeing these lobed systematics on either side. And on the right, we've done um, some efforts to try to make the mock data look like the, the, this real data. So we can see we have this kind of foreground power and we have these double lobed systematics um, that occupies the same regions in Fourier space as the data. Um, so this right panel is what we actually push through this analysis pipeline. Um, and our, we, we use the same algorithms for calibrating this data and uh, filtering out these systematics. And this is kind of one of the end result tests that we do. We do a number of tests, but this is one of the big ones. And the main thing we're trying to see is as we take our data, this mock data set, we form the power spectrum and then we average the data together. In other words, as we integrate the noise down, we want to see that we can recover a known EOR signal that's in the data. So that's what uh, you're seeing here. Uh, the data uh, has, as I said, foregrounds, it has noise, and it has a realization of an EOR-like signal in it. Um, and what you're seeing in dashed lines is the thermal noise as we integrate down. So going from blue, orange, green to purple, you're seeing more and more of our data being averaged together. And what we want to see is at the 4A modes where the EOR signal uh, reaches an SNR above one, we actually make a detection and that we don't just average past it, um, if you will. And that's what you're seeing here. So uh, this gray line is the, the actual EOR signal in the data. And you can see when we do integrate down below the EOR at the Fourier modes where we detect it, that pops out of 
the noise um, and we don't uh, you know, integrate past it. We don't suppress it uh, in our recovered data set. Um, and we do a couple of st statistical tests to understand uh, to what accuracy we can do this. But this is largely what you want to see. And so this has helped us understand uh, the pipeline. And one of the, the major things that came out of this um, analysis in the, in the last slide here is an understanding that our, 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 our analysis pipeline had a 7% bias in the overall flux scale that we were, we were using. And so we were able to actually correct that. So we're, look, we're able to probe our pipeline at the 7 to 10% level, um, which is roughly consistent with the limiting uncertainty on our analysis anyways. Okay, so with that said, I'll leave you with my summary slide, which is um, a detailed understanding of systematics is, is absolutely key to 21 centimeter science. Um, in HERA phase one, we're finding that we're able to mitigate these systematics nearly down to the thermal noise uh, for K of 0.23 and, and higher. Um, and as a consequence, we've been able to set some world leading limits on the power spectrum. However, more work is needed to actually make a detection and that's what we're working on now. Um, so thank you. And I'm happy to take questions now or during the Q and A. Excellent, thanks very much, Nick. Um... Yep, great. So uh, we do actually have a few minutes for questions now, if anyone would like to ask them. So just to remind you how the Zoom thing works, you can ask your questions in the chat or using the Q&A function. Or if you like, you can also raise your hand and I can um, figuratively pass you the mic. So so I see there's one raised hand. It's from Yinjie. So um, I'll, I'll give you the floor, Yinjie. Hello? Hello? Yeah. I'm an okay. audible. Hello? I'm an audible. Hey. Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, yes, nice talk. Uh, in your last plot, you show different color lines and average equals one all the way up to 125. What does that mean? Does that mean the number of dish you average or what? Yeah, this is just showing the number of samples we're averaging. So, you know, I have, say, I have a total of 125 power spectra. I'm gonna cumulatively average more and more of them. And so, you know, in your head, you can just see that this is going down as root N, this noise floor. Uh, and this is just an example, as I average more and more data together, effectively as I'm averaging, averaging the noise down, I make a detection of the signal when it comes out above the noise. That's what we wanna show with the validation analysis. Okay, so it's, great, it's baseline, yeah. It's, it's proportional to baselines, yeah. Great, thanks very much. Um, still another couple of minutes for questions, if uh, anyone has any. So um, Nick, just while we wait, I, I might ask a self-indulgent question, which is uh, to ask about the, the the software pipeline itself and how much of it's open. Because in um, open. yeah, do you mean open like uh, open source, publicly available? Uh, publicly available, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, almost all of it is, which is nice. Um, it's easily accessible at um, GitHub slash Hera dash team Hera team. Um, yeah, it's it's almost all publicly available, if not all of it, um, with the exception of perhaps some of our correlator software, which probably is actually. Um, yeah, it is, um, and some of it, some of these techniques are fairly easily applied to other other kinds of experiments, um, and we welcome people who are interested in in trying to trying to do that. Excellent, thanks. So I'll I'll just give it another thirty seconds in case there's. Um, one more question, and we'll we'll move on after that. Okay, I think we're good. So um, thanks very much again, Nick. Uh, you, you're sticking around for the Q&A, I believe. So thank you very much for that. Um, in that case, I will pass on next to uh, Andre. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear you and I can also see your slides. So please, whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, first of all, thanks Bill for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk. And obviously thanks also to the HERA uh, collaboration who, who, without whose uh, efforts none of this is actually uh, possible. And I'll try to show you what some of the amazing results, even with like these really, really preliminary uh, observations that Nick talked about, uh, we were able to do some, some nice science. And that was in particular led by these early career researchers who I list here below, Yusheng Chin, Jordan Miroka, Julian Munoz, and uh, Stefan Heimerschein. And I think Stefan's giving uh, a short talk. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, they posted a short talk uh, explaining more details uh, as part of this. So, um, so yeah, so I don't need to really motivate why we are studying Cosmic Dawn. Um, it's, it's one of the fundamental uh, epochs of our universe. We heard more uh, we, about this um, in Anasta with Anastasia's talk this morning. Um, it's the last major phase transition and it actually uh, uh, spans the bulk of our cosmic light cone. So if you wanna ask, you know, where can we get the most data out of statistically, <laughs> this is it, that, that, that this is where the bulk of the, the light cone, this is where the future actually lies because of this. So how do we, uh, what do we currently know? In the past few uh, years, we've learned a lot about the timing of the epoch of realization. And here's a companion of a paper that just came out. Um, by Brad Grigg, a compendium of few observations, including uh, uh, posterior from, from uh, Monte Carlo, uh, run of several observations. And we can see that we, we have sort of a consensus that reionization, the midpoint is roughly around uh, redshift seven. Uh, I wouldn't trust the details of, of these shapes, but like we roughly know when reionization is happening, um, uh, in particular around redshift seven and eight. And that's going to be important in some of our hair interpretation that, that we're going to see later on. The details of this process, uh, how galaxies evolved, when they formed, how they interacted with each other are, are uh, almost completely unknown. We do have observations of galaxies at high redshifts, even up to redshifts 10 and uh, 11. Uh, and, and these are showing some luminosity functions of these galaxies, the number density per uh, UV luminosity bin. Um, but if you do some, some crude estimates, uh, you can really see that what we're, what we're actually observing currently with Hubble is really just the proverbial tip of the iceberg. And the bulk of the galaxy population lies down here in the magnitude. And potentially the very first galaxies lie even down. So, so we're, we're missing uh, the vast majority of the galaxies. And even with JWST, we're not likely to observe the typical galaxies. So what we're seeing is you know, the, the, the brightest uh, few, essentially. And so how do we study like the bulk of the galaxy population? Well, this is where 20 centimeter comes in. Um, and specifically, uh, this is where Hera, the, the, the reason why we're here, uh, comes in. This is, this is an actual, uh, satellite image of the telescope. And this is what we would like to see. Now, this is a cosmic signal. The, this is a light cone. So you know, along one axis, you have the uh, a slice through the transverse direction. And on here on the horizontal, you have the redshift axis. So you can see that starting from dark ages, you have uh, the birth of stars and the epoch of realization. And this encodes a lot of physics um, as we can see in the equation here below, that this shows the brightness temperature that we see uh, of the gas, um, which, which depends on the ionization state of the gas, the density of the gas, and also the temperature of the gas and some cosmological terms. And so you can see this beautiful dynamic range, these patterns that we see throughout cosmic history, and they tell us something about these galaxies. Uh, what do they tell us? Well, if you take reionization, um, the, the patterns that we saw and the timing of those patterns tell us about the, the what are the typical galaxies that are in dominating the ionizing photon budget 
during the EOR. And so if you look at something like what, what, what if, if there were abundant faint galaxies versus rare bright galaxies, like the ones that the, the few ones that we see today, you would get very different patterns, uh, even at the same stage of, of randomization. Um, uh, the, you can quantify this in terms of the power spectrum of the 20 centimeter signal. And you can see that basically, at, again, at the same stage of organization, at about, roughly 50% ionized, there's almost an order of magnitude and difference in the power spectra that is in excess of the future signal to noise that we'll get from uh, HERA. And so we can, can use this to constrain our models of, of variance and galaxies. But it's not only the ionizing UV emission, we also have this uh, uh, temperature term in this equation that I showed. And the temperature, uh, the spin temperature, which is defined by the this relative level populations and can be related to the gas kinetic temperature, um, we think is dominated by X ray binaries. Uh, uh, it's one of the, in the, in the early universe, here's an estimate of the X ray binary velocity versus redshift compared to other sources and above redshifts of six or so, we expect that indeed the high mass X-ray binaries dominate the X-ray background. Um, and so what, what, does the, the, what does that mean for the temperature evolution? Well, here you have uh, the kind of mean temperature versus redshift. I, I removed the labels here because we don't know the actual the timings of this. But roughly speaking, the CME temperature, uh, we know decreases as one plus Z, uh, the gas, temperature, uh, kinetic temperature decreases as one plus C squared after thermal decoupling with the CMP. And at some point, the um, um, some, some, some heating mechanism kicks in, X-rays uh, most likely uh, shine once the first uh, generations of stars form and they rapidly heat the gas. And so while, it's, while the gas is below um, the CMP temperature, um, we see it in, in absorption once it's above, we see the, C, the 21 centimeter in emission. Um, and then the spin temperature, which we actually measure, interpolates between these two. Um, there, there are some possible deviations from this. We, uh, there could be potentially a, a very loud radio background uh, from if, if there were abundant many quasars and other uh, exotic objects that would actually put a radio background that could be in excess of this. Um, maybe the x-rays were less efficient and maybe the gas continued to cool. And so then the signal will would become a larger and larger because we're measuring essentially the difference between we're using the CMB or another radio background as, as, as the background that, that uh, whose contrast we see the, the gas with. And so because of this divergence, um, the lower the redshift, the larger we expect the signal in the absence of heating. And that's something else that we, we will also uh, get back to in the error results. So I, I mentioned this temperature term. What does that actually mean for the sources of, of galaxies? Well, you can distinguish even again at the same kind of stage of, of, of the cosmic evolution, you see the patterns are different. If you have a hard SCD versus a soft SCD, you can see the hard SCD because the, the, the photons travel uh, further is more washed out. But there's soft SCD, you see that uh, it's a sharper uh, fluctuations in the temperature. So that's roughly how we get it with these patterns. How do we actually quantify it? What we want to do is, is we want to have a, uh, you know, a Bayesian pipeline where we start with the 21 centimeter signal. Here's the, the map that I showed. Um, we quantify that with some metric like the power spectrum, and then we do inference on astrophysical parameters and cosmological parameters. Astrophysical parameters are extremely important here. And so for those of you familiar with, with the CMB measurements, everybody's comfortable with you know, the standard uh, lambda CDM or other CDM parameters. Uh, but what are astrophysical parameters? That's, that's not something that, we, that, that, that are fundamentally born out of our cosmology. So we have to characterize them somehow. Um, luckily, the, the observer, observ observable signal on, on well, the signal on observable scales is sourced generally by tens to hundreds of galaxies. And so what you get uh, by doing kind of ensemble averaging are uh, power law scaling relations. And this is a generic product 
of, of ensemble averaging. So you could imagine a, a simple model where you characterize the uh, stellar to halo mass relation with um, a power law dependence uh, with normalization power law index, um, some characteristic star formation time scale, and you set the dynamical time of the halo, uh, some ionizing escape fraction, again, uh, that's a power law, and some turnover at faint uh, magnitudes due to feedback or inefficient cooling in, in the small halos that can't efficiently host uh, star forming galaxies. So this, this is a simple, uh, simple model, six free parameters, but this is, uh, again, sufficient to characterize um, uh, uh, the galaxy populations that we currently know. Here are some, some UV luminosity functions that I showed earlier. You can see that that, that that can be reproduced with this simple scaling model. And also that's something that we get out of hydrodynamical simulations um, and all SAMs, all basically the faint galaxies, they, they all seem to follow these, these power law relations. You can argue about where the power law is, what is the amplitude, what is the scaling, uh, but the, these kind of shapes seem to be generic. And then, as I mentioned before, we care about x-rays, so we can characterize uh, x-rays in some manner. Uh, this is showing uh, a theoretical model of an x-ray binary SCD. And so we can characterize the relevant energies, which are the soft band that interact with the IGM by some, some power law and then maybe a turnover uh, scale due to self-absorption. And so this, this, this is by no means a unique parameter set. There are many choices of parameters, but this is, um, let's say, a, a minimalistic and flexible model because everything's related with uh, essentially power law scaling relations that they can be used to uh, interpret with more detailed physical uh, models of the ISM first uh, galaxies or hydrodynamical simulations. So how does this work then in practice uh, when we put the, we have all the pieces that I mentioned. So how do we work, how do we use the practice? Well, we have an observation. Unfortunately, we don't have an observation yet. We will have an observation. So for this purposes, I'm taking this to be the mock observation. We need to characterize this observation in some statistic um, in this case, I took the power spectrum, um, assuming a thousand hour integration from the full HERA instrument, which hopefully we'll have a few years down the line, uh, you would get power spectra at various redshifts that look like this, uh, masking out the foreground dominated modes that are on large scales. But then you also have other observations, and that's important to note. Um, we have, as I've mentioned a few times, we have UV luminosity functions that tell us about how uh, the star formation rate scales with uh, the halo mass. Uh, we have these at various redshifts, high redshifts. We have observations of the timing of the EOR, as I already showed, uh, most importantly from the CMB optical depth. And so we can combine all of that into a forward modeling framework. Um, and here I'm showing uh, just a sample. In this case, we, it's the same seed as the mock observation, but in practice, we vary the seed, um, shown corresponding to a red points in this, in this parameter a space. And um, we can see that before I start this MCNC movie, we can see that, that just randomly sampling gives you a large uh, distribution over things like the, the monosity functions, the UR histories. But we'll see that, that driven by these observations, these three observations in this case, the, the uh, MCMC here will quickly converge. So starting from these, these distributions that are all over the place in these panels, we can see the monosity functions are converging. We can see the, the ER history is converging. The 21 centimeter power spectrum is converging. Uh, mostly at lower redshifts, quickly at lower redshifts, and then more slowly at higher redshifts where the noise is larger. And we can see that we're recovering the mock ups here. So this is, this is essentially the future. This is what we have now, um, which is amazing progress, uh, uh, as Nick has shown us, um, based only on uh, two weeks, essentially, of data. Um, so, so, you know, much more preliminary, but already we can make some, some very cool uh, claims. And specifically, they're gonna be driven by our deepest limits. And that's this guy here at Redshift 3. 
these are upper limits. Again, it's important to note not detections, but upper limits consistent with thermal noise. So because there are upper limits, you can ask the question, well, what, what is the easiest thing to rule out? The easiest thing to rule out, obviously, are models that have very large powers so the upper limits rule those out. So if we go back to this uh, equation that I showed here, we can see from this uh, temperature term that if the, the spin temperature of the gas is uh, much larger, so it's hotter than the background, like the CMD temperature, for example, then this term saturates to unity, right? However, uh, before that happens, because of this difference, one plus Z and, and one plus Z squared evolution, you can have that the spin temperature is much lower than the CMB. And so when that's the case, this term actually can, can go uh, up to negative few, negative 10 uh, uh, or more. So you can actually get, a, 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 in, in emission, you get a factor of one from this term. In, in absorption, you can get a factor of 10 from this term. So the, the easiest thing to rule out are cold IGM models, and that's going to be important, where this, uh, the gas spin temperature is much, much lower than the radiation temperature. So that's the mean signal. You need something to imprint fluctuations. These are, these are interferometers, so they measure fluctuations. So you need some one of these terms to give you also spatial fluctuations. So you can either use the, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, you can either use the um, ionization fraction or the neutral fraction here of the gas. This is patch EOR. So, so a, a gas part of the pixel is uh, either uh, ionized or neutral. This gives you zero and one or you need fluctuations in this term. Um, you can get fluctuations just from the matter density. This is standard uh, matter density uh, power spectrum. Um, fluctuations that are then could be enhanced by having a low temperature. And then you could also use the temperature itself to give, um, to source fluctuations if there are spatial fluctuations in the temperature. In our analysis, we, we don't find these temperature models uh, that are sufficient to exceed the limits because the, the generally require analytically very, very soft SCD, so very rapid transition from a, a, a hot to a cold patch of the IGM. And that's something that, that is not really part of our prior volume. Um, so, so, okay, so we have these two, two, two versions. One is a cold, they're both cold. Uh, one has fluctuations driven by patch EOR, and one has fluctuations driven by, by density, in which case EOR has to have not started yet because the density is, needs to be uh, sourcing the, the power. If, if they're both uh, sourcing the power, then you actually get a decrease in, in, in power because of the cross terms of, of the two fields. So this is a, is a slice, an example of such a model that is ruled out by Hera limits. Here we have the density field. Um, here we have this uh, cold IGM plus EOR fluctuation. You can see the EOR uh, bottle of um, structure here. And here we have just density fluctuation. So in, the, so in this case, the EOR hasn't really started yet. Neutral fraction is one. And in this case, the EOR is ongoing because it is still getting its sourcing of fluctuations. And here are the resulting power spectrum. The um, red is the, uh, the, the density driven one, and blue is the organization. And in both cases, they exceed this era uh, power spectrum limit. Um, you, can, you can see more closely where these models lie, like what are their properties. Um, this is the EOR evolution. And, and in blue are these realization driven models, and in red are these density driven models. By definition, they have to be, uh, they're, they're more neutral. This is just color coded based, all these models exceed the hair limits, but this is just color coded based on where their neutral fraction is at redshift six. Um, so you can say that there are two modes. As I said, there are a few models in between because the cross terms end up uh, reducing the signal. So you need one of these terms to drive the fluctuations. However, of these two modes, one of them is uh, consistent with what we know about reionization. As I mentioned, we have reionization constraints, and here's the distribution of Planck tau e. And only the reionization driven model is consistent with that, whereas if you have no reionization, you, you fail to reionize the universe. Another way of looking at that is through this plot that I showed earlier, which is the EOR history. And here is the redshift of the Hera band two observations. 
And we can see that based on other, other observables, we know that randomization must be ongoing. So essentially the density driven fluctuations that require uh, an almost fully neutral IGM are, are disfavored highly strongly by what we already know. All right, so then you put everything together in this uh, inference pipeline that I described already, and you get a corner plot, and I won't have time to go through all the corner plots, but we did this uh, in, this is led by Yusheng Qing. We did this with um, uh, all of the, most of the relevant current observations that we call without HERA. So this includes the UV luminosity functions. You can see it already that our UV luminosity functions are highly constrained by these observations, unlike in the preliminary uh, prior where they're all over the place. Uh, EOR history is constrained. And then we have, uh, we added HERA to that. So that specifically I could list here some of the observations that are, that are in the two. Uh, so with HERA includes the without HERA, which are the UMASI functions and a couple of EOR observations, but it also includes the HERA H1C power spectrum. And by comparing the tan to the purple, you can see most of the parameters are unaffected except for this guy. And what is this guy? This guy is the, um, X-ray luminosity per unit star formation. This is a zoom in on that panel. And if I show you what is, what is the current state without HERA, it's basically our flat prior that we start off with. But then when we add HERA, we disfavor um, weak X-ray luminosities because again, uh, HERA rules out uh, uh, disfavors cold IGM. And so we need some source of, of heating um, uh, extra heating to, to warm up the IgM by reaching eight. And so we disfavor weak values of this x ray to star formation rate parameter. Um, we know we have a, a limit of star formation because we need to reanalyze the universe as well. So, so it's not like we can just turn down the star formation rate and ignore it. We need to reanalyze the universe. But then that means that the luminosity for star formation rate can't be too low because we also need it slightly high. So, um, so if we compare that with current observations, uh, uh, the current estimates of where local X-ray binary sits are right here, which is in this disfavored region of practice space. But theoretical models suggest that uh, the, the first galaxies, because they live in metal uh, 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 three or metal uh, low metallicity environments, they would have higher uh, X-ray metallicities, and so we're perfectly consistent with this prediction. Prediction again, it's not an observation; it's prediction that the early uh, galaxies, the early high uh, mass X-ray binaries, would be more X-ray luminous than current ones. Um, you can cast these into uh, the posteriors on the temperature. This is the temperature of the neutral gas component. The ionized one is sitting at. Uh, 10 to the 4 Kelvin or so. And you can see that uh, just prior without using any observations, we have this gray curve here. This, this, this region here is the adiabatically cold limit. So, um, uh, so, so most of the, the, the volume is, is above this um, space. Uh, so our prior looks like this. Uh, when we add in these observations uh, without HERA, we uh, essentially disfavor these uh, the gas that's sitting at between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 4, because these uh, warm temperatures um, we require reionization and we have a limit on the star formation rate density. So these these cells essentially get ionized uh, when we add in current observations. But when we add in HERA, we now disfavor uh, this region of parameter space. Sorry. Slide. So the cold IGM is disfavored by the HERA observations uh, because, again, we know the EOR is happening, and so, so cold models would give too high of a contrast, and so these models are, are disfavored. We did a sanity check. This was from uh, uh, 3D realizations. We did a sanity check. This was led by George Mioka. Uh, well, uh, another way of, 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 of getting these same kind of limits, but using toy models or phenomenological models that directly model the, uh, the bubble, uh, the ionized structure um, and the associated 21 centimeter signal without passing through galaxy parameters. 
So they're more phenological, more empirical, and they start with the density field, and then they put uh, ionized bubbles that assume some distribution of bubble sizes and, and uh, how they correlate with the density, and you get a 21 centimeter power spectrum. You can marginalize over the assumed distributions, and you get this marginalized posterior of the spin temperature uh, versus the ionization state of the gas. The, the earlier plot that I showed was, was marginalized over the ionization state of the gas. Um, and you can see that this, this uh, phenological model is pretty well consistent with the uh, full 3D simulations. The phenological one is in green here. The full 3D has this, uh, this purple area. Uh, it prefers this region here because I showed uh, that, as I showed, we have uh, constraints of the UR, but the green is roughly consistent when it comes to the temperature constraints. I'll get to that in a minute. But we can also constrain, let's say, non-standard models, something that we wouldn't expect, maybe something that's not part of our standard lambda CDN cosmology. And this, in this plot, it's a bit of a busy plot. Um, we'll guide you through it. Uh, here we have the, this plots the spin temperature in, uh, in unit normalized to the radiation temperature. So either the CMB or if there's an excess radio background, it's normalized. So, so at one, you know, it's this stuff that's below one is seen in the emission, uh, absorption stuff that's above seen in the emission. So this is how the, in CDM, we expect this to evolve adiabatically here. And at some point you could have heating that would cause an upturn in the spin temperature. Um, if you add in an additional uh, uh, extra radio background, if we have some like radio loud galaxies at high redshifts, this, this ratio, because you're increasing this term, would, would come down like this, you would still get a heating term. But you could also have uh, exotic uh, dark matter models. So there's these millicharged dark matter models that were popular. Uh, they, they, had, they were proposed earlier, but they came popular as a way of explaining the edges uh, observations that required colder IGM or required lower curves in this, in this uh, plot. And so if you assume something like 0.5%, which sits on current limits of these millicharge, uh, the 0.5% of the dark matter is in the form of these millicharge dark matter, you would get, you would lower this evolution uh, of the, the temperature curve and it would follow something like this. And so by, by getting a constraint on uh, this value from Hera, you could put in uh, limits on, on these models. If you believe edges, that edges is cosmological, you need something that, that essentially goes uh, down deeply and then comes back up because edges also has an edge on one side. So if you believe the cosmological interpretation of that, that's still highly controversial, um, you would need some form of heating as well as a cold IGM. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but for these millicharge dark matter models, we can put them on these, on these uh, plots that are favored by particle physicists. Um, and here's the charge uh, of the particle uh, versus its mass. And these are regions that are ruled out by other um, observations. The edges signal, if you were to explain it with this, would lie here. And Hera, if you don't assume, if you say there's no heating, the Hera would rule out essentially this observation. That's not surprising because we know that uh, um, we need some heating by rate of state, um, but also edges itself would require heating because you need the signal to go up in this band. Um, the other thing we can say is these, uh, we can add in an extra radio background in excess of the CMP. So it's nothing, not something we would expect if we look at uh, uh, you know, uh, theoretical models and empirical scaling relations. But if we, you know, if we, we allow for this flexibility, it, it, you know, we could have some a population of radio loud galaxies at high redshifts. And in that case, the, the temperature, the background temperature here that we see uh, the gas in contrast against can be larger. So if this term is larger, then we can make this term uh, even more uh, negative um, for the same spin temperature. And so if we include this as a different uh, simulation, uh, different parametrization and a, and a, and a different, uh, yeah, different parametrization. But if we include uh, a, a, an extra radio background uh, in this framework, and then we compare to 
uh, just the Hera observation, we get um, uh, that this region of parameter space, which corresponds to uh, really allowed galaxies that are also at the same time um, uh, X-ray faint, so cold IGM with, with a strong radio background is, is ruled out this combination is, is this favorite. And we'll hear more about that by uh, Stephen in this talk. Uh, and again, edges uh, are neither uh, disfavored or supported by Hera because if you look at the edges models here in purple, uh, you would need them to be, you, you would need the, the signal to come back up uh, before we get to the hair observation. You need some heating to get the signal to come back up before the hair observations. And in that case, um, by definition, models that are compatible with edges um, would not be disfavored by the limits. So this is by definition. So if you combine these four uh, estimates, you can combine them on this plot of the uh, temperature of the gas. And here, here are shown the two sigma uh, limits um, using various analyses. Here I'm showing the early career researchers that really led uh, these efforts. So I encourage you to contact them for more details. Um, but we have four different independent analyses and they all, if you look at the, uh, the HERA limits, they all roughly are consistent with each other at the level of, this, of, of uh, the, well, excluding the adiabatic cooling limit, which is shown here in red. So just to conclude, um, the properties of the unseen first galaxies are imprinted in the, in the pattern of the one on centimeter signal, the radiation imprints, uh, the fluctuations in the ionized uh, fraction and the temperature of the gas. The current limits based on two weeks of data are, are provided by HERA, provide the strictest uh, limits to date as we, show, as we saw by, uh, with Nick's talk. And they imply some heating by redshift of eight because of this, the, the help that we're essentially getting that we know the EOR is, is, uh, is ongoing. And so if the EOR is ongoing, then we expect fluctuations in the IMAX fraction. So we need, we can't have the temperature to be really low because the power would, would shoot up. Um, the hair limit suggests that those galaxies were more extra luminous than local ones. It's a marginal claim, but it's still you know 1.5 sigma, and this is actually consistent with the red cross. But it's the first, it's the first measurement that we have of this. Uh, you know, it's the first time we can say anything about X-ray uh, the properties of redshift 10 galaxies. Models with a strong uh, well, anything at that level of precision. Models with a strong X-ray background. Uh, combined with the weak X-ray luminosities are disfavored. Uh, if you allow for uh, radio background access, they need to disfavor this, this um, um, uh, joint region in 2D space. Um, and the four different analyses that we had in this paper roughly agree on the temperature limits. And at two sigma, we get something that the, the, the minimum temperature is around three Kelvin, which doesn't sound, of the neutral gas, it doesn't sound incredibly uh, impressive, but the, the uh, adiabatic limit is something like 1.7. Uh, so, you know, it's comparably, it's, it's, uh, it is, it's, it's good, you know, it's a good constraint for considering it's only four weeks of data. I mean, two weeks of data. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's all I have. And uh, thank you for your, your time. Excellent. Thanks very much, Andre. Um, so we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, so as, as before with the Zoom thingy, you can ask questions in the chat via the Q&A function, or if you raise your hand, I can um, you know, digitally pass you the microphone. So, so we'll have a few minutes for questions now. So uh, while we're waiting for that, I, I did have um, a quick question about how the systematics play into this and um, wh whether you've done much work trying to understand if that might 
you know, so some of the systematics Nick was mentioning, for example, cable reflection, stuff like that, they impact particular K ranges. Um, do we understand well which parameters might be more sensitive to the impact of those? So, no, the answer is no. That, that's something that um, we definitely need to include in the forward modeling. Um, um, obviously, as you know, the difficulty is, is designed parameterizing the systematics and coming up with priors on, on these. Um, but it's something that we can reasonably simply include in the forward modeling, but right now this is not done. So the analysis that we show here is, is purely uh, based on uh, essentially a prior that the systematics um, cannot give you a negative signal, but if, if they have an unconstrained flat prior being positive uh, as possible so as can be, which allows you to use these limits at face value as upper limits. Um, if the systematics were negative, then, then you could use them as, as upper limits. But this is, this is the first analysis that we have with this pipeline. Uh, with, with the next generation of limits, we uh, are planning on improving our pipelines. And, and that's one of the things that will definitely uh, include, which is, is including in the forward modeling, not just treating these as upper limits, but including in the forward modeling both systematics with some priors, as well as thermal noise, um, and then you know, actually modeling the observation, bringing the the, the comparison closer to observation space. Great, thanks very much. Um, while, while I'm at it, I do, I do have another question about um, the likelihood and in particular the, the possibility of making the likelihood function public and you know what the plans are with respect to future data releases as well. Sorry, the likelihood function is essentially public, like it's in the paper. I'm not again, misunderstanding what, what you're referring to. Oh, I, 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 I mean, can you derive? Yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, just in, in, in the same way that um, CMB experiments include likelihood functions that uh, fold in with the systematic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, our current likelihood is, is almost trivial, which is why it's, it, you know, it's an equation in the paper. Um, um, obviously, as, as things become more realistic and we're not treating these as upper limits that are uncorrelated, right? Yeah, they're uncorrelated upper limits. So, you know, we have these, these electrodes that are essentially like error functions. Um, but, but, you know, as, as our understanding of the systematics gets better, as we, as we include the, the window functions explicitly in in this, it's, it's not just in a in a rough uh, way um, where we're throwing away data that we think is highly correlated. Um, we will obviously be making those uh, public. Excellent, thanks. So um, I'll just give it another few seconds to see if there are any more questions. And then we'll be moving on to the lightning talks um, immediately afterwards. Okay, I, I, I think not. I think you were too clear, Andre. Everyone's questions are already answered. So. <laughs> um, but thanks very much for that. Are, are you able to stick around for the Q&A? Uh, yeah. Great. Great. So um, that's only in about 20, 25 minutes. So, so in the meantime, um, thanks to all of our uh, invited speakers. We'll have that uh, general Q&A for an hour from about 2.30 till 3.30. But in the meantime, I'm going to um, share a few slides for lightning talks. And these are... Uh, supposed to be very short talks just um, to advertise some of the pre-recorded contributed talks we've got online, um, which I, I will, the benefit of latecomers, I will pop a link to the web page in the chat again. You can access a, a YouTube playlist that has all of those on it for your convenience. Um, for now, I'm going to...
unmute the, the people who need to be unmuted, which might take me a second. Okay, and then I'm going to share um, share my screen. Oh, and then you can hopefully see this. So um, the lightning talks we have today, we have three, um, and I'll, I'll just do it in, in alphabetical order. So we've got Samir. Um, and Stefan, I think uh, Pascal is also online. I think Pascal, I, I don't have a slide for you, but uh, if, if you want to explain what you've been up to um, and, and what your talk's about, you're more than welcome to. Uh, I do have a recorded lightning talk from, from uh, Bobby as well. Uh, it's a little bit on the longer side, but we'll see if we've got time for that. And then, uh, as, as I mentioned, if you go to this website, um, you can find a link to all the pre-recorded talks. So there are lots of good stuff e extending uh, some of the, the discussion we, we've been having today, stuff like non-redundancy, um, extra radio background models, um, the, this mutual coupling effect, which seems to be quite important, um, and uh, different methods of doing upper limits and stuff like that. So um, let's start off with um, Samir. So are you able to unmute Samir? Yes, yeah. And uh, hopefully that is... Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so here we are trying to study the primary beam non-redundancy for the HERA. Uh, so uh, so is, it is already mentioned in earlier talk, the HERA is designed to be redundant. So measuring the sky signal repetitively to reduce the noise. But there are lots of other factors due to this due to this redundancy may not happen. There are some non-redundancy may present. So we have studied this effect non effect of non-redundancy using the simulations. Uh, in the left panel, in the, what we show, oh, mainly we are perturbing the primary beam in different ways for the different antennas. So for some cases, is the primary beam main lobe is. Uh, same, but the side lobes might be different. All other cases, side lobes is same, but main lobe is different. Or sometimes it may the beam is whole the stretch, uh, which is different for different antennas. And these types of non redundancy, if present, how much it affects our measurement or basically the power spectrum. So, the y axis we are plotting here is a decoherence. If it is zero, means the array is perfectly redundant, but if it is uh, if there are some non redundancy present, it will be uh, some non zero values. And what we see so, different types of non redundancy we introduced in our simulations. We see uh, for all our cases, so the x axis is the uh, LST, the time of observations. And we see that for all cases, the non redundancy is for this type of simulations, mainly the uh, foregrounds, is less than 2.5%. So this is one of the simulation study for the non-redundancy. So I request all of you to uh, the video for the details. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much, Samir. So I think next we have um, Stefan. Stefan, are you able to uh, unmute? Yeah. Yes, I am. Um, hi. Yes, I'm, I'm Stefan. I'm a third-year PhD student. I'm working with Anastasia, and I just have a have this um, recorded talk where. Um, we just talk about how we get from these power spectrum limits that Nick showed earlier to the astrophysical parameters in a bit more detail. So with what um, Andre showed earlier, well, in this case, we focus on these models with extra radio background. So where we don't just have the CMB as a background, but also potentially early galaxies or some other sources of radio background. And um, we talk about, okay, yes, on the one hand, how do we get this likelihood? We talked about this earlier, this kind of step function, where does this come from, from the data? And then how do we, um, put limits on yes, astrophysical parameters, so say on the efficiency of radio heating and on X-ray heating and on IgM temperatures, especially in the presence of extra radio background. And after the second slide, um, the edges question from, from this morning added the second slide here. Um, and to make the two comments, um, yeah, so on the one hand, if you take the full edges trough for granted, so in the top left plot, um, these models, they all have a 
peak in the post sector much earlier at much, much higher redshifts than HERA. So around redshift 17 or higher as opposed to redshift 10 and 8. So we wouldn't be able to constrain these models. But if you just look at models that have a deep enough absorption trough at redshift 17 without necessarily requiring the, requiring the trough to be as narrow, then you can in fact um, look at these models and compare them to the HERA limits. So if you want your IGM to be very cold by redshift, at redshift 17, or your radio background to be very high at redshift 17, which are the two explanations for edges, then you need to be have heating by redshift 10 in order to be compatible with the HERA limits again. So those are the two kind of answers to this question. And yeah, thank you. Please email me if you have any questions and please watch the, um, the talk on YouTube if you are interested. And thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much. So um, I know, Pascal, you're, you're online, but uh, did, did, did yeah. you want to briefly introduce your talk? Yes. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, so I don't have any slides, but I, I'll just uh, quickly advertise my talk. So um, yeah, I've, I've been working on closure phase analysis with HERA. And for those of you who are not familiar with closure phases, uh, closure phases are um, inter interferometric quantities, which are independent of antenna base and direction dependent gains, um, independent gains. So that means any analysis involved in closure phases doesn't require any calibration. And we can actually use that to, to um, set up limits on the epoch of reionization. And the analysis um, is able to bypass many of uh, the processing steps required in the standard visibility analysis. And so if you're interested in that and to hear a bit about how, how, how this approach works and what kind of um, up limits we have so far, then yeah, please watch my talk. And if you have any comments or suggestions on how to improve our analysis, then please um, um, get into uh, contact with me. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, I do have one more pre-recorded lightning talk, which is a bit longer um, by Bobby. So I will play that. And then um, at the same time, we, we, we do have a break coming up, just a short break before the Q&A session, which will start at 2.30 p.m. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll just queue up the, uh, the video from Bobby. And as usual, I'll pop a link to that in the chat as well. So everyone can follow along on YouTube if they prefer. And then uh, we'll, we'll, after that, we'll reconvene at 2.30. Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Pasqua. I'm a graduate student at McGill University. And today I'll be telling you about how we validated our analysis and power spectrum pipeline that we used to produce our phase one upper limits that were published earlier this year. So jumping right into it, I first wanna talk about why validation is important. So what this figure here is showing you is all of the software that is between the raw data that comes out of our instrument and the power spectrum estimates that we publish. Collectively, all of these boxes represent some 10,000 lines of code. And while individual coverage is quite good, I think we average at least 95% coverage of our code. Uh, unit tests can't answer everything. And so that's where validation comes in. We try to answer the questions that you can't really get at with simple unit tests. So how do we do that? Through forward modeling. Uh, basically, we simulate what's on the sky. We simulate our antenna's response to what's on the sky. And we also simulate <clears throat> systematic effects that we know are in the data. And then we take all of that together, push it through our analysis pipeline, and push it through our power spectrum pipeline. And we try to look for instances where some of the software might induce loss of power or might introduce spectral structure that we don't want to be there. And additionally, we try to answer the question of whether we could detect the cosmic signal once we have enough sensitivity to do so. So how does it actually work in practice? Well, we proceeded in steps. In step zero, we were answering the question of whether our power spectrum pipeline actually works by just simulating a pure cosmic signal and seeing that we could reconstruct the signal. In step one, we added foregrounds and are basically testing that our foreground avoidance technique works. 
In step two, we're testing the calibration side of things, making sure that it doesn't introduce spectral structure or cause us to lose signal. And step three, we try to get at some more nuanced questions. This 3.1, we are testing uh, basically how we fill in the gaps that get produced when we flag RFI. And in 3.2, we're testing some of the systematic subtraction that we do after calibration, but before power spectrum estimation. And in step four, this is our big end-to-end -end where we simulate everything we think we can do at a reasonably realistic level and then push it through all of the relevant pieces of the analysis and power spectrum pipelines. So now the big question, right? Was validation successful? Well, we found some instances of signal loss and we were able to account for that before publishing the upper limits. Uh, this first one I wanna talk about is up here in the upper left. Uh, this is a bias in our absolute calibration step. It turns out that if you use a logarithmic calibration step in a low signal to noise region that biases your gain solutions high. So that effectively manifests as power loss. And when you propagate it all the way through, we find for the first band we used, we had about 11% power loss for the second band, about 15%. And we accounted for that accordingly. Uh, down here in the bottom left, we're testing one of those systematic removal steps, basically finding a a good set of parameters to use that minimizes the amount of signal that's lost from there. And we account for that uh, in publishing our limits. And then in the bottom right, this is seeing if we lose any signal when we perform the LST averaging step. And on this slide here, uh, basically what this is telling you is in regions where the cosmic signal dominates over the thermal noise, we do a good enough job of removing the systematic effects, uh, calibrating our instruments, and you know we would make a detection of the signal. Uh, assuming that the systematics we simulated are accurate and you know there aren't any things we're missing. Though it's important to note that we are testing that the software does what it's supposed to do when the assumptions that it makes are met. We're not validating the quality of the data, but the performance of the software. And now I quickly want to wrap up by just talking about the big ideas here. Uh, so we test our software in isolated steps and also in an end-to-end -end framework. Uh, we forward model everything we're capable of modeling in order to actually do this test so that we always know the answer. Uh, we respect the assumptions of our analysis routines. We do our best to find lossy techniques and account for them before we set our limits. And you know, validation is now an integral part of the analysis process. And we make sure that every power spectrum or set of upper limits we publish are validated before they are sent for submission. So. That's all for now. If you want to learn more, uh, come by the longer recorded talk that I've prepared. Thank you. Great. So thanks for all our speakers. We will reconvene in five minutes uh, after a short break uh, for the general Q&A session.
my folks. So we'll uh, get started with the Q and A in just a minute. Um, I think actually, so originally uh, Danny Jacobs was going to um, share this session, but I think he's temporarily um, disposed. So um, I, I'm going to step in for now and do that. Um, the idea is so um, we've got a few panelists here, um, several of whom you, you've already seen talks by today. Um, I really welcome questions from the audience on any dimension of, of, of what you've seen today, um, be it uh, something straightforward, conceptual, um, or um, you know more more technical and, and, and in the details. Aha, there's Danny, um, and actually. So okay, if I pass over to you, Danny, to kick off the Q and A. Yeah, sure. So um, we have um, me, Josh, Nick, and um, Andre, and a couple more people. Let's see, Samir, Stefan, and Pascal also. Um, so we'll just take questions. So I, I think I'll I'll just monitor the uh, chat and. Um, uh, and for hand raisings, maybe, and uh, we can take it from there. Great, and, and I do also want to encourage, uh, particularly, uh, I know there's a few students on the call, masters, PhD students, uh, people at different stages of the careers. Um, you you are, are really the priority here, so we'll, we'll give you priority if you do have questions. So um, While folks are composing their questions. Yeah, go ahead. Are there any uh, like broad discussion topics, Phil, that you think would be good for the panel? So, so yeah, I, I did have a couple jotted down. So um, I, I know this is a, given the time zone, um, it, it's a predominantly British slash European slash South African audience. And I, I, I kind of wanted to just ask a little bit about how Hera fits in with SK, given that it's, on the SKA South Africa site, and you know, have have we learned anything so far that that is is going to be um, nice to feed into SKA, given that the, the low frequency experiment in Australia. <laughs> yeah, I think we have. Um, so I mean, we've. We've learned a lot about instrument spec specifications. Uh, so, um, uh, for for example, um, the um, we've learned a lot about um, the importance of um, really understanding your analog and digital systems, in particular digital systems. I think people didn't really properly appreciate the difficulty in making a really linear system that has like five orders of magnitude across. Um, of, of stability across its amplitude across as a function of frequency um, there's a lot that goes into that and we learned a lot recently about that and i think a lot of that's being fed into the development of the next generation mwa system which is a more tightly coupled precursor to the uh, ska low that's the one that jumps to mind maybe uh the other the other people have some other insights into this Well, um, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. Um, actually, so Nicole and Gianni and um, Brad, myself and Florent, we, I think we gave a talks at the recent SKA precursor conference. And one of the things that came out of that was a paper in uh, the Journal of Astronomical Telescopes, JETIS, where we summarized uh, improved limits with all the SKA precursors or pathfinders, so MWA, LOFAR, and HERA, some of the things that made those improvements possible. Um, Hera in particular, right, is, is the least 
similar to what SKA will look like just in terms of layout. Um, but nonetheless, I think what the interesting kind of synergy here is not just a foreground subtraction or avoidance, there's something in the middle, right? You're never going to be able to subtract all of the foregrounds. There's gonna be some interplay between suppression of foregrounds through the kind of point source modeling that LOFAR and MWA are taking. That's gonna that's gonna get us a lot. And then there's gonna to have to be some amount of emphasis on foreground containment, which has been a huge uh, uh, emphasis for Hera is designing analysis techniques that explicitly uh, you know, try to both contain and filter out leakage. Um, and there's been obviously a number of fronts on this, both with MWA and LOFAR. MWA has pioneered um, their version of uh, calibration smoothing with polynomials. LOFAR does this consensus optimization to enforce spectral smoothness. We do this with Fourier filtering. Um, so I think this is beginning to take hold more widely uh, in the international collaborations, but I think there's going to be some synergy between foreground subtraction that LOFAR and MWA are doing and the kind of containment strategies that HERA is pursuing. Now, I, I think, is, is it fair to say that um, a fair fair chunk of this depends on the accuracy of, a, of the absolute calibration you can manage, which is kind of partially determined by the accuracy of your sky model as well. And with sky models, are we not now at the point where we're kind of pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? Like, like the existing, you know, we, Gleam was mentioned a few times um, in, in, a, in a couple of the last talks, but we, we know from a few papers by Nicole and, and Aaron Neil Weiss and, and, and a few other people that, um, you know, we can bias our calibration quite, well, too much if we don't have high fidelity um, sky models as well. But where are those going to come from? We're going to have to make them ourselves with our own instrument, aren't we? Go ahead, Danny. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, but not necessarily. I mean, right, like um, the MWA uh, and Hera look at the same part of the sky as, as will the SK low. Right, and then in the northern hemisphere, um, you have overlap between the various long wavelength arrays in the U.S. and LOFAR. So, um, I think you can you can kind of mitigate the sort of bootstrap problem. You can pull yourself up by someone else's bootstraps, uh, but there will still be some degeneracies. I think. Yeah, I would add also that in general, no telescope is really perfectly situated to do everything in terms of a sky model. Um, a telescope that's really good at at finding point sources and measuring their fluxes precisely is not necessarily the same one that's great for uh, for measuring the diffuse polarized emission in the galaxy. Um, I think there's an analogy here to, to the concept of breakaway background actually, which is as people are thinking about building um, Simon's Observatory and CMBS4, they're thinking about a suite of telescopes that are specialized to different angular scales. And I think it may be the case that that is also useful for building things that, you know, if you're designed specifically for foreground subtraction, understanding the foregrounds, it may be that the telescope that is best designed for high sensitivity is not the same as the one for measuring the galactic foregrounds, for example. Mm, yeah, except, I mean, the, the, the sort of scale bifurcation there i think comes back to like like underlying science questions like there are some science questions you have to go to large l's and some that you know l of one is is the thing you want so i i think um everybody has there's nobody nobody's going to build a telescope just to do foregrounds no um but they but might do, do a filter you know like if you're thinking if you're you know your analogy is um the cmb you know a band adding a band to your telescope so so um I like to talk about like, at, you know, at trying to leverage, like you, you want to, <clears throat> foregrounds are smooth ideally. And so um, adding more bandwidth, for example, to your instrument than you actually need to do, um, uh, to do the particular redshift band that you're interested in is, is I think essential uh, because it lets you it essentially, it, you know, not use that part of the band for your foreground model. So you can, you can interpolate uh, over over that, and I think um, this is all, this has been a challenge for a lot of for, for every telescope. Basically, um, I think 
paper slash Hera has had the largest, you know, sort of simultaneous bandwidth. The MWA's bandwidth limit of 30 megahertz has been, um, requires more time basically to go back and reobserve a different overlapping bands. I, I'm I thinking more in the, the further future we're talking about the scale of telescopes that are more on the hundreds of millions of dollars or billions. Um, we may want to, ha rather than this, the current scale where we're talking about, you know, order of $10 million. Um, there, I don't think anybody wants to build a telescope whose job it is, is to make another one, another telescope slightly better. <laughs> it's hard to motivate that. But, it, it, you know, in the very long term, there has to be some coordination here if the goal is really to model the sky to one part and ten to the five and subtract it out. Um, one, so, so a related question, which is perhaps more scientifically um, uh, impactful in the long term is, is cross-correlation because it has the same kind of issues, right? You're trying to uh, cross-correlation with other observables like um, intensity mapping of, um, of uh, atomic lines like uh, lemon alpha or carbon or uh, CO. CO, yeah, stuff like that. <clears throat> So and maybe um, somebody somebody want to comment on, on on the possibilities there and did, have did, I, I I missed Andre's talk but maybe he talked for Anastasia that maybe they talked a little bit about this but um, what what are we thinking about for Hera specifically that we could do? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Andre. Sorry, Sorry could you repeat the question? Oh, I, I was just sort of asking about the general prospects for um, uh, cross correlation between other other measures. We've seen recently that Chime has had had some success here. Um, going back even further, the GBT experiment was able to first first detections seem to come from cross correlations because you get rid of systematics a lot. And I'm just thinking, you know. Yeah, I mean, we have so so Jordan Marocha is doing uh, is looking into. Uh, possibilities for cross correlation. Um, it's tricky because of uh, largely because the time scales involved, right? If if you were to say hair is going to be alive um, ten years down the line, fifteen years down the line, then you know we have uh, Roman. You know, that we can, that, that Roman's probably the best choice because it's wide field, right? So you need you need anything that serves as a tracer of the matter field. It doesn't really matter how much, uh, what galaxies you're picking up as much, but but as long as you have a tracer of the matter field, you can do a cross correlation, which then would help you, with, as you said, with the systematics. Um, but uh, you're a bit limited because, for example, like things like uh, Subaru, which has short term. Lyman alpha emitter fields it doesn't have good sky coverage with uh, with Hera, so things like Roman is the best bet, but the time scale for that, uh, you know, it's not clear what's the overlap with with uh, with Hera. So I mean, the short answer is, you know, we're looking into this. Um, there are other things like KSC and stuff. Um, if Hera can can uh, be funded. For for a, a decent extension, then I'm confident that we could do a, a cross correlation. So um, there are a couple of kind of purpose purpose designed intensity mapping experiments and other lines too, like um, SphereX and um, Time Time Pilot CO Map. Yeah, uh, things like that. What 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 are your thoughts on you know? A, a, are those kind of in the right ballpark specification wise to be able to give us a useful cross check if we do eventually get a detection? So I, I didn't, I personally didn't go look into the details of, of many of these spirits that was, was downscoped uh, and, and it's focusing more on the post EOR uh, intensity mapping. Um, there is another version that's further down in the pipeline that is that is focused on high. I think they will cover some EOR, but uh, my, my like at a lower signal to noise. But so, but yeah, the short answer is I uh, I don't know the anything quantitative. Um, 
I just, I think Spherix is also launching uh, I don't know. I, well, okay, I don't know. Uh, two years? Two years, yeah. Okay. The less data time. should come in a few years, yeah. So potentially, pot potentially we could get something, but uh, again, because of the down scope, um, we have to rerun some of, there were estimates of the cross correlation, but, but these were based on, on previous uh, Spherix proposals, not the accepted specs. Um, so okay. yeah, I mean, I, I agree cross correlations are the way to do it. Um, it's just something that, you know, as we have a better landscape of the timing of the instruments that are available to cross correlate, then, then we can do, it's easy to do, you know, forecasts and, uh, you know, push the pipeline into the cross correlations once we have data. My understanding as well with the, with C2 um, is that most of the planned observations have a very narrow field of view, just kind of mismatched to Hera, that the field of view is basically a pixel for Hera. Um, so there may be some work you can do cross correlating that, but I'm not, sure if the penalty you get for having that kind of mismatch makes a detection likely. Yeah, I mean, this is the issue with JWST, right? That's the first thing that people think of, that the, that the field of view of JWST is, is quite small. Um, that's not to say that you can't do uh, cross correlation. So, so, you know, one could do, especially with, with the JWST, you have the grism. So you pick up the, the line of sight modes potentially of galaxy surveys and we would be able to potentially cross correlate with it. That's something that we're planning on looking into. Um, but that's going to take a, you know, some years as well. So, you know, 10 year time scale, I would say. Right. And at the beginning, we had talked about um, uh, using Hera as sort of like a finder map uh, to look for high redshift uh, ionizers, right? And this is Adam Beardsley's paper from whenever it was. And but this, um, but the, the terra is not ideally suited for this because you would you want to get you want to keep the phases to be able to say like right and that's what he proposed was was essentially wedge filtering and then imaging and even with a wedge filtered image which is not really what things would look like it has a really gnarly PSF there's still a uh, pretty good you still make a pretty high probabilistic um, cut on pixels that are the, the dimmest pixels, and those would be associated with ionized regions at fairly high probability, um, particularly if you chose the absolute largest ones. Um, and then if you, uh, it, there's some yeah. details to work out, but um, it, theoretically. I just, I just think the time scales really, really mess us up there because you, you would need to put in a proposal to JWST to point at like, two ends of the PDF of, of, of Para, like the INI is the neutral, and you would need to put in the proposal and that observation would need to carry out. And by the time we actually have Hera data that can actually make that claim, I, I'm not convinced that JWC will be accepting proposals. So, but, you know, we, we yeah. I don't want to sound too negative. I, I do think that we'll be able to cross correlate but you know, gun to my head and say like, what are we cross correlating against? You know, I, I, I don't want to commit. The the good south field is overlapping with the Hera band, and JWST will observe that. So we may be able to come up, come along later and say. This is what I think we're going. We have to do the post analysis of JWST fields, and we're going to use they. They are doing uh, in GTL mode. They are doing actually some some uh, tiled, uh, you know, reasonably what reasonable fields. And also, yes. as I mentioned, the grism. And the grism is actually going to help us a lot because the, the, the foregrounds don't live as much in the, in the line of sight. Are they going to, so is, is that, my understanding was that um, that the deep field south was not suitable for a, a further a further depth. <laughs> it was still, <laughs> we started to be confused. Um, is that, is that true? And, and, and so now I, I'm completely, I'm, I'm ignorant. I don't think that we're in the confusion limit by any means. I, I do think that Josh is right that, that, that JWST is going to reobserve uh, the deep fields. There's definitely going to be overlap. Um, yeah. But like even some of those haven't been defined yet. So cool. 
they will be defined within the next like year or two. It's a limited duration instrument. Right? So okay, well, I think we've beat that question to death. Is there a? Um... I would encourage the contacting also Jordan uh, because he's the expert on right. on this. So. I, I did just want to check back in. So, so you did mention the KSC or KSZ effects <laughs> um, and things like Simon's Observatory, eventually CMBS4. I think that they are really gunning for this. They, they expect maps. They expect to be able to do quite a lot of KSZ stuff just on their own. Is, is that perhaps the more um, feasible route since it will be wide field for cross correlations? It's 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 tough. There were a few papers uh, that looked on, on this. I know Paul Plant did uh, recent work in James. Um, the the problem is that the 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 foregrounds. Uh, if you do wedge, I mean, uh, foreground avoidance, you lose a lot of the modes. And so the only thing that you're you're really left that is sensitive to are, but you lose a lot of the long wavelength modes, right? And so. Uh, and so that means that the cross correlation kind of kind of drops out. If you were able to dig deep into the into the wedge and preserve some of the longer medium range modes, then uh, that would be great. Um, so it's it it really depends on what you assume for for the. Also, if you had more extreme uh, EOR models that are perhaps more extended and have larger bubbles. Um, that would help in the, in the cross power. Um, so, you know, it's going to go step in step with our foreground, uh, let's say, characterization and trying to dig deeper into the wedge, up well, closer to the wedge, let's say. I mean, I, I suppose a nice thing is for cross correlations, you don't have to do quite as good a job of foreground removal as you do for autos, right? Exactly. So you can have some, some, systematic residual systematic because it's not going to crop it's just it's going to add to your noise turn right you're going to have larger noise variants in the cross but Need you're not pixels. going to you're not going to bias the mean uh so that that that's exactly right it's certainly something we're relying on at lower redshift with experiments like well gbt and meerkat <laughs> uh we 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 know uh foreground removal is um very difficult to do well enough but we can we do seem to be able to get i mean there's a recent paper by uh laura Voltz and some other people on a gbt cross eboss um detection of the cross spectrum at a redshift of about 0.8 i think things like that so, so we know we can do it at lower redshift without fantastic foreground removal um but yeah so it's noisier, there's signal loss, uh, certainly some technical issues with that. I mean, the nice thing though, is that we, you know, it's not going, something that we'll be able to do post facto in, the, in a sense with the data that we have. Um, as long as we keep the data, you know, we, we keep digging into it. We have the fields at the bands that are going to be relevant now that they turn out to be relevant to the low bridge advance where you have more structure, you have more EOR structure and galaxy structure. Um, you know, that data is not going to disappear. So I'm, I'm confident that eventually we'll have some, some cross signal and stuff. Well, I think for some, some, some of the um, other missions, though, or some of the other. Um, observatories choosing of the deep fields and the, you know the fields that are going to be observed um is still something that can be influenced or you know um so i think i think that's one of the that's one of the key sort of things that we're talking about now and coordinating with other projects is seeing if we can encourage overlap at, in places where there's some flexibility yeah i mean zero further we can already you know do that you know to just point away from the galaxy. Um, but actually telling them, hey, look, there's a cold spot over there. Can you, you know, oh, well, keep yeah, integration yeah. there? It's, we're going to need some time for that. 
you know, that's that's in the future. Um, I have a discussion topic, which could maybe also be interesting for some people here, particularly Danny, um, which in kind of in the same vein, which is, you know, especially, if, you know, Phil brought up SKA going to SKA low going forward, but this is also true for low redshift experiments, which is the field right now, we're very much in an upper limit mentality in a paradigm of upper limits. We, we integrate our data, we see a detection, we don't believe it's EOR, so we set upper limits, or we're noise dominated and we keep integrating until we do detect a systematic. And at some point, if we want to do our science, we will have to build confidence in a detection in the autocorrelation. So in HERA, we've been doing some work, uh, including like uh, you've heard today from both myself and Bobby and, and Josh on validation pipeline, but we've also been doing some kind of semi-blindedness into our analysis. This is something that we're starting to do. Um, and there's some lessons I think to be learned here going forward. Um, so, um, you know, how do we make that shift in paradigm from upper limits to detection with the autocorrelation? Obviously we just talked about cross-correlation as one way to validate a detection, but strictly from an autocorrelation perspective, how do we get there? Uh -huh. I think there, there's a number of things that one can do to build confidence. And the, the most important is, well, I'd say there's two that are, that are most important. One is this validation that we've been talking a lot about, which is if you apply this data to this exact same analysis technique to data where you perfectly understand what you put in, do you get out what you expect? Are there biases there? Are you missing systematics, things like that? So, you know, how are you dealing with the known unknowns? And then there's there's statistical tests, which Phil here has been doing a lot of work on for Hera and a number of other folks um, to try to split the data in a variety of ways and say, you know, the EOR should be statistically isotropic and we should be able to detect the same power spectrum level to some statistical consistency level in multiple places on the sky. It would help, especially if we could also make a detection of more than one redshift and say something about that. So I think we're not going to be able to make a detection until we have a lot of signal to noise to burn, so to speak, which is to say we're able to split up our measurement and make a number of different detections that are at lower signal to noise and say these are all consistent with having seen something really strong at high signal to noise when we do our deepest integration. And I think that's the kind of thing that builds confidence. So I think um, there's also a kind of dimension of, of looking what physics, other observational methods are implying as well. I mean, I have mentioned the KSC effect, but, you know, JWST is also going to start putting pressure on some of the um, reionization parameters that, um, you know, uh, Andre and Anastasia were talking about. Not, not all of them, perhaps, but there's a kind of uh, physical consistency argument as well. That doesn't always work. Uh, we have things like edges, which um, <laughs> the, the physics doesn't add up um, unless you, you push to quite exotic models, I think. So, um, you know, maybe that's an issue, but the, there should perhaps be a sort of um, concordant picture if that emerges. Um, people might feel a bit more confident about whatever we are saying about this period of history. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a valid point. Um, we have, as I showed, we have already an idea about where EOR happened, you know, roughly, and that, you know, this is without any 21 centimeter data. Um, and so you could do a data cut and say, what do we get just from 21 centimeter if we actually do get some kind of detection or some kind of constraints based on some uh, marginal detections? Um, we can put those points separately uh, in, in our EOR histories and, uh, and see if they're consistent with uh, other knowledge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we, we we do we do these kind of consistency checks without even really think physics checks you know without really even thinking about it if we see a huge detection in one redshift bin and nothing right the other side of it implies you know an evolution that just couldn't possibly have happened you know in a reasonable kind of way so um 
I think I think it just makes sense to try to get better and more sophisticated at this. Like 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 our, like like is currently happening in the global world, where um, uh, the sophistication of like Bayesian model selection and and model fitting is is moving to incorporate both calibration and models at the same time, and trying to really um, you know weigh the evidence in a in a sort of you know, uh, in a way that combines those two things together. We have a couple of questions um, from Boom asks, um, how do we build confidence in our sky models are both foreground and UR uh, that they're good enough? And I think this goes back to the question that we, we had discussed a little bit earlier about, you know, using multiple instruments and, 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 and things like that. Um, I think uh, there's really, and just not using the sky, not using the sky model um, in the bins that we're actually observing. That, that's Danny's. <laughs> Well, I think Boom is actually asking a more specific question, which is if we're doing a, a pure simulation of our instrument and we're putting in some model of the EOR and some model of the sky, how do we build confidence that those models are good enough to say that our analysis is doing the right thing? Ah, well, I think we, we I think the, the simplest answer is the kind of stuff that um, uh, Nicole Berry did for her thesis, which was to, to simulate errors and and ask the question, you know, what at what level um, does an error when I you know put in one thing for my sky model and then I assume another thing when I do my calibration or subtraction on it? Um, then then you actually have that that answers that question. Um, now the question is, how do we know <laughs> when our when our actual sky models are are good enough? I think the answer is try to get more people to put error bars on there. <laughs> Flux is, is a really good start. Uh, we, we get these um, diffuse models that just don't, I, none of our diffuse models currently have error bars. Um, you can infer error based on frequency variation and stuff like that. As long as you have, you can parameterize your unknowns, it, you know, we can do this in a standard Bayesian way, right? Right, but, but for example, um, in, um, in uh, Ruby Burns, um, uh, uh, all, 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 all cal, I forget what you call it, um, every cal, <laughs> um, which combines sky and redundant in a Bayesian framework. Um, there is a, there is a, a covariance for the sky, for the sky model. And no one knows what to put for that. No prior <laughs> that. We don't have, we, yeah, we have very little, we have some, but, but not great priors on uh, what are the error bars on our, on our sky models based on, you know, other, other observations. If you look at catalogs, uh, you're, you're lucky to get a flux error. Yeah. Not to mention that if you're going to go down to sort of a deep instrumental level of the visibilities themselves, the kinds of covariance matrices that you need to write down to do a proper Bayesian thing get very large. Yeah. Um, the computation is, is scary. And folks have thought about that in the context of smaller um, you know, smaller systems of equations or, or subsets of data, and it's shown that you know, in principle, this is possible. Um, but in practice, it's quite hard. And so, it, it is incumbent, I think, on those methods to prove that they're that the benefits of them <laughs> outweigh the costs in computation. Um, yeah, especially when there's so much yeah. uncertainty you go at the on the inputs. Phil, would you? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm quietly optimistic about the Bayesian approach just because it has worked quite well with the CMB. It is um, horribly computationally intensive, like you're saying, but if you can get it to work with various um, tricks, so some people in my group are trying some out, GIB sampling, things like that, um, uh, you know, multi-level multi, multi -level, um, equation, uh, linear equation solving, all that stuff. You can make headway. It is very difficult. You do end up being quite constrained in what kind of parameterizations of your model you can write down. But I think it's possible. And I think there is some useful extra stuff to get from it. But I totally agree. It is incumbent on people like ourselves who are working on these kind of methods to, to prove that you can get anywhere with it. And, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think sorry. it's going to be a lot of CPU hours. Uh, we'll, we'll have to go into that. I, I would add as well that. The Bayesian work, I think, is going to always progress from the cosmological parameters upstream. Like it's everyone agrees more or less that when you start with the when you're trying to you know measure ten numbers or whatever it is with the cosmological and, and astrophysical parameters, you ought to do that in a Bayesian sense. If there are clear degeneracies between these numbers, you want to really understand the posterior. 
And as you push from there to maybe like your, your deepest maps that you're trying to do foreground subtraction all the way up toward the time order data, it's harder and harder to apply the Bayesian techniques just from a computational perspective. But the more you can expand from the back of the pipeline up, the better you can build confidence in your results. I completely agree. That's a hundred percent our philosophy of some of the stuff that we're doing here. That's, that's we do have another question uh, from Alec who says, do we believe our understanding of systematics and instrument and the instrument to the point that we would claim a detection on our own and not wait for uh, a joint detection so as to not fall into the complications and misfortunes of other instruments. Um, I think that like goes into what we were just saying. The auto versus the cross correlation. Yeah, we would need, we would need That's a to slight... know, Sorry. We would, to, we would need to be able to characterize all of these things. I, you know, but he might be asking a little bit different question um, rather than cross between like other physics like carbon two or something, but like, uh, try to try to like jointly make a statement on the autocorrelation in with um, another 21 centimeter instrument. Um, I think that's what he's getting at. Um, I think that is difficult because um, Hera has more sensitivity than any other currently operating or plan to be operating instrument in the next five years, um, which makes a um, sort of, it, we are not in the, in, in the, in the regime of say, um, a, a maybe like a ground-based CMB instrument that uh, happened to be operating at the same time as a, as a very sensitive orbiting instrument. And you could, you know, potentially have at least, you know, some, um, uh, sort of diplomatic cross channels that let you, you know, do some kind of cross comparisons. Um, we're not, we're not fortunate enough to be in that case right now. Um, we should still, you know, do our best to try to, um, to try to have those kinds of conversations, I think. Um, and I think that's part of the peer review process. So um, I think, I think that's, that's where we'll rest probably. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we're going to rush to announce a, a result without peer review like Bicep did, which is, I understand why they did it, but it turned out to be the wrong choice. Um, I think we will probably pursue very aggressive peer review. We may, you know, if we're hoping to claim a publication, a, a detection rather, it might also make sense to solicit our own peer review. I think so. Um, yeah. You know, bring in like a uh, a team of competitors or you know potential detractors to really make it, you know, make us sweat a little bit. People wielding axes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This sounds a red similar. team, sometimes we call them. <laughs> yeah, and this kind of goes along with data challenges across multiple collaborations, taking techniques from an entirely different analysis pipelines and applying that to other experiments, data sets, or the same data set. This is something that um, we did a little bit. So um, uh, there's a technique in, that's used in the LOFAR uh, pipeline using Gaussian process regression for their foreground subtraction. And something that myself and Adrian did was look at taking that and, and putting it in the statistical formalism that we use for quadratic estimators. And we learned some really interesting things about that pipeline, in particular that it's somewhat lossy, uh, depending on what kind of EOR models you're actually looking at. Quite interesting. Um, these are the kind of cross checks that go on in other domains of you know fundamental physics that I think with the, prolifer the pr uh, proliferation of multiple premier 21 centimeter telescopes, there's multiple groups and analysis pipelines that will be able to use as cross checks against each other to some degree. Obviously they're tuned for the specific experiment, but um, some of the statistical modeling software I think is gonna be important in applying that across different data sets. Um, so, mm -hmm. so we did this exercise a few years ago with the MWA um, that Danny led, where we use multiple pipelines on the same data set and tried to demonstrate the consistency or inconsistency. Mm -hmm. But to try to use multiple pipelines from different telescopes is the thing that has been yet to be done. Uh, we are, there, there is, there is a, a group in um, 
uh, the, the in, in Hera that that uh, the, the UW group is attempting to do this, um, trying to uh, adapt the pipeline, the FHD pipeline developed for the MWA uh, to Hera, um, and um, works great in simulation. <laughs> so um, that's that's a good start. And there's there's a lot of um, uh, sort of I think there's a lot to be said for building similar instruments. <laughs> Like the more similar your instruments are, the easier this is, um, I, which means that you span less of an interesting instrumental um, experimental space, but it does mean that um, you are more able to cross check. Uh, one nice thing is that uh, Hera and MWA are basically the same latitude, which makes for an interesting, um, very useful, uh, we basically look at the same sky. Um, in fact, we have very, you know, there's some almost identical baselines between, between the two instruments. Um, not, not least because uh, the MWA phase two has some sections that are laid out using the HERA um, antenna layout, um, which is, uh, I think, uh, going to become very useful <laughs> as we start doing detailed checks. So Alex brought up edges, um, which I think is a, an interesting topic. I'm curious what, how people are feeling about the edge of detection uh, or putative detection a couple of years later, and what role Hera might play. Status is yeah, peer review. I don't know how many people are involved in the business, but uh, yeah, well, I don't know, probably should disclose the rumors. So, well, it is no, more than rumors. Um, talks have been given, uh, but. <laughs> um, yeah, so at the at the global uh, meeting a few months ago, uh, SARS-2 reported uh, levels that are uh, smaller than the edges signal. Um, that is still in review. And I was hoping to see a talk about it at Solve, and I didn't. So um, I, I remain... Uh, uh, thirsty for more. Um, I think the, uh, the, the, real, the real question is, and it was never really like, what exotic physics is driving this, this uh, clearly obvious right thing. The real question was, there's a lot of checks that were done on that instrument and still can't figure out what's going on. So, um, you know, given the fact that like, you know, some, something like on the order of several hundred variations, experimental variations, we're not able to reveal the very, very subtle system. This is the most precise antenna in the world <laughs> by some measures. Um, it, 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 I think to me, it raises the question of how are we going to do the same thing? How are we going to understand our instrument at that level? I well, think global, the, global is tougher as you know, right? Like, I, I, think, I, think, I think a case could be made that it's not <laughs> because it's one antenna, but- um, Yeah, but you have the yeah. cross checks with different, you know, essentially each, each, each pointing is a global, but it's also yeah. more complicated. The, the electromagnetic environment is much more complicated with the interferometer, too. Um, yeah, sure. that's right. That's right. More, but, more, more antennas, more problems. As, as... But the number of numbers we're trying to measure, the interferometric signal, is a lot. there's a lot more information there than there is in a global signal. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you, if you do a, a, like a principal component analysis of the edge of signal, you're trying to measure, like they've measured basically 10, 12 numbers above some noise floor. And it's pretty, like it's, it's a few more numbers than the number of parameters they're trying to constrain. And it's just really hard. You're measuring a smooth thing, a pretty smooth thing and trying to distinguish it from a slightly more smooth thing. And at least for us, we're trying to measure a very sexually complicated thing from a smooth thing. And so fundamentally we have an easier problem from a data analysis perspective. Yeah, uh, but you have way more data, which makes the observing and the building the instrument and commissioning, calibrating all of it much more. Like, I, I well, calibration is, is very challenging in both and for different reasons. I mean, if you if you think about it from a FOIA mode kind of point of view, which is not the right thing for you know a smooth experiment, like a global experiment, but like if you think about it in terms of adjacent modes, um, you know, we're observing right next to the wedge, 
your 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 the, the n plus one modes, right? And 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 away from the problem, right? You're like you have this you have this really steep drop roll off in your um, in your contamination as a function of your Fourier modes. You're trying to observe right next to it. It's like I I think a, a colleague um, uh, suggested that it's similar to um, uh, a coronagraph, like trying to observe a planet next to a star in terms of a similar dynamic range, the foregrounds to the background. Um, in that way, I don't see much of a difference. Like if you're trying to look at like a, a bin right next in a in delay space, right next to something that's 10,000 times brighter, how is that really any different than trying to see something that's slightly less smooth? I think, I don't think it's actually that different. Um, but the, uh, I think, I think we, on a, from an instrumental point of view, we're learning but a lot have, about- Can I just push back a little bit on that? Like if you have reasonable priors for what either the systematics or the actual signal should look like, it's not just, you know, nailing down, you know, one number or two numbers in some uncorrelated way, you know, if you, 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 have a few bins in case space, but you you know you don't have you, the chance that you have something that goes like this uh, is almost nil because of the priors that you put in, right? So and you smooth and redshift. No, it's smooth and redshift like like a global experiment. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And you have both redshift no, but, and but yeah, also in in. in but in well. in practice, at the very lo like lowest sensitivities, we get like a bin in a red in in each redshift bin, right? So we're looking for something that is like sort of smoothly varying in redshift, um, and and you get like a number. And, I, and I don't think we're going to claim a detection from a number in a few redshift bins. I think I, we're going to need multiple redshift. I think you have cylindrical case space, and you have some very low signal to noise things that are in sampling some cylinder, that's how I think of it, yeah. some cylindrical wavelet, case, wavelet space. And with each one of those bins, you can't do anything. But with all the bins combined, <laughs> as long as you have a decent prior on, on, on like, you know, excluding crazy shapes on both systematics and the cosmological signal, with those priors in hand, you know, even with a very low signal to noise, the fact that you have so many low signal to noise things, uh, uh, you know, help. I mean, st statistically, it, it does help. Now, maybe I'm, I'm being naive and like being able to get priors uh, like I'm talking about, but you know, I, I think I think the real to, to me the real answer is the sort of the way that the community is progressing and, and like treating detections and thinking about it and trying to come up with different experiments and really tackling the instrument it's it's good to see other people like other all the experiments that have cropped up to try to tackle the instrumental problems in different ways and to learn about it um i think one of the some of the challenges are things like you know what is the impact of i think Dave, david is it repetti that had the uh, a, a paper about what is the impact of the shape of the horizon on, on the on the signal i mean that that kind of stuff is uh is absolutely essential at these kind of dynamic ranges and you just never, so i I'm, I'm looking forward to um seeing you know the, the kinds of things that we're able to do now it just kind of blows me away like the, the degree to which we can simulate the instrument the sky um and then flow that all the way through to you know to do a, something like a, a blind challenge like that nobody's as far as I know um, I don't I haven't I'm not quite current with what the outcome of the latest SKA blind challenge is maybe there's been some progress there but um, our blind challenge uh, for Hera a couple of years ago to do the valid the validation for these first results was the first one I've seen and um, I'm hoping to see a lot more of those from all the different projects because that all just technically being able to like send data from one telescope to another and it has, was just never possible. And now with um, some of our file interchange work, um, it's now possible and stuff like that. It just makes being a student in this, in the, in this, uh, in this world, uh, like you're not, you're not, you're not, in, you're not inventing steel to make a steam engine anymore. You're, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're able to pick up tools and get to work, which I think is going to make things actually possible. Is that a segue yeah, to think, boom question? I it think, is a, uh, a segue to the boom question. <laughs> we have another question. Uh, 
Sorry. Wait, if you have something to say, Andre, go ahead. But no, I just wanted to underline what you just said on a more optimistic note. Like you, you, you know, whenever I get sad about, you know, the 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 the, the state of progress, it, even as you said, like it's it's been astounding how much, given where we started, how much we've done, sort of thing. But like, you know, whenever I get sad that we don't have, you know, don't have a detection in hand, I I I, I you know I, I tell myself the signal is there. Like we know the signal is there. It's not one of those things that that oh is it or is it not like we're not testing some weird string theory model that like chances are you know it's just you know, some some mathematical stuff the signal is there this is where more, more than half of our universe looks like eventually we will map it eventually and, so speaking, and when we do we'll get a nobel prize so <laughs> we being in the <laughs> community global community so you know it'll it'll, it'll come at some point it'll come uh, yes. Yeah. So speaking of future, so uh, Boom asked the second question, how can we retain um, uh, early career people, um, given that we, uh, we have not, we've not been, we've, we've, people sometimes like come along, they invent cool things and, or they do uh, work and learn how to do things, as he points out, uh, and then leave. And, and um, I, think, uh, I think that's true of any field. Um, it, it, for us, it's been particularly um, um, it's been, I'd say we've been batting about a little bit less than half maybe, um, which I think is appropriate. You know, maybe there's pretty big error bars, but you know, people go off to do other things. So um, I, I personally don't know that we need to retain everybody, um, but uh, what do you guys think? So you said half, are you, are you projecting towards the ratio of, of, of permanent positions to graduates well there's, there's, there's like a huge number there's there's different there's different points right there's like people that choose to go on to a postdoc versus don't um people that graduate with their with their phds and then go off into industry for example yeah um and then and then you know people that for example take a postdoc in a different field um is another is another route um people that um um uh, come in as that, that are maybe on the project as, as postdocs, but then um, take jobs and other things, you know, so, so there's, there's lots of reasons, and lots of ways for people to go about their business. And, and I, don't I was just curious that. about that 50%. Was that just the, uh, uh, no, that was, that was not, that was a, that was a, that was a, my estimate of the, of the, of the sort of path splitting at any one of those points. Ah, uh, okay. Because we haven't actually had that many people to do good statistics. My you know, our n is like fifteen or something like that. Not great. It's hard to compare ourselves as well to other subdisciplines of astrophysics in terms of the retention of people. Like it's very anecdotal. I don't think we're particularly better or worse than other subdisciplines of astrophysics. I think uh, it's yeah. a structural problem. The, well, I think the, the fact that we don't have, I mean, uh, a lot of, a lot of, in, in principle, there are, there are, for other things, there are observatories, and there should be more uh, technicians and, and, and project scientist roles and, and these kind of things that can employ a larger number of people, not in the academic framework, not in the, the you know, professor framework because the fact that we're like limited to, to retaining permanent positions for a large part to make professors is not an efficient you know, yeah. <laughs> labor market model like this this is you don't want to go down this route so you know hopefully things like SKO SK does have have some some labor hiring you know, as, as a growing observatory that are going to be somewhat stable somewhat permanent and if we get if get more of those kind of roles uh, again, non-faculty roles that are still permanent, that would help the field immensely. There, and I, and I'm, I'm pre, I think uh, the, uh, the office, SKA office has been doing a lot of uh, pre-hiring, I guess, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but there's been, you know, career fairs and then um, please, you know, like, like trying to identify, I guess people that maybe will be looking for jobs in a year or two or something like that, uh, priming the pump maybe, I'm not um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wealth, I'm involved in both, so I, you know, I don't have to badmouth uh, SKA, like, uh, I'm a huge fan of SKA, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, that they'll, it's a well-funded instrument, and it's an observatory that is essentially un, undefined, like, it's going to 
be there indefinitely uh, with running costs um, associated to that. And so hopefully their pool of, of, of scientific expertise, they, I mean, they started modestly, but hopefully that'll, that'll expand to include some of these mm -hmm. roles. I think, I think in the inherent question though, it's not just the economic factors, which are largely out of our individual control, uh, but also whether there's any systematic approach to sociological factors. Um, are we doing, are we, are we understanding whether there are leaks in the pipeline, so to speak, that don't need to be there for economic reasons due to some kind of, you know, inclusion concerns? I think that there, there certainly are some of those factors at work. Um, I mean, just in terms of gender balance, for example, like the, this, this meeting hasn't been particularly gender balanced. Um, we did try and invite more um, women, for example, um, but that just causes problems in terms of women, because there are fewer women, they get invited to lots and lots and lots of things and are totally overcommitted. Um, so uh, the, the, there's definitely a pipeline leak just on that particular dimension. And, and, and you know, I could name a, a few other dimensions as well. Um, I think SK... Yeah start to help addressing that because it, it is a very broad-based collaboration with a lot of governmental support. I, I don't think they're going to um, allow the community to get away with not prioritizing things like that so easily, if that makes sense. Well, I, I think that the difficulty that Josh was pointing to, particularly like the, effectively that in the U.S. anyway, uh, in, um, universities are heavily subsidizing the research, the engineering uh, effectively by hiring people to, you know, to, uh, because they, we don't have an engineering staff sufficient to really do what we want to do. Um, I think if that could be changed, um, then the, because because effectively what that means is that that you, just just to just to continue um, uh, as a career um, person in this field, you have to go through this 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 sort of completely un, you know, diff, uh, unnecessarily challenging gauntlet to compete for one of the very few positions, right? Just just to stay involved as as a as you grow in your career. That's silly. Um, so I think the real the real solution here is to try to do something along the same, like to try to basically have the same kind of support level that we that 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 you would enjoy in the SK or better. And you know, I think to a certain extent, some of that might will, will, will have to be baked into the next iteration of, of whatever comes after Hera. And I think it's up to it is up to us actually to make sure that that happens. To make sure there's good level of um, of staff and that there's good policy in place to make sure that those are um, as broadly based as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. So um, I'm just, I have one eye on the time. I think we're, we're almost um, up here. So I, I, I think it might be time to, to wrap it up. So if there are any kind of um, last quick questions, please go ahead. Otherwise we can um, start to wrap up. Yeah, if you've, if you've had your question there almost written and you're just not sure how to just hit return. We'll read half of it. And then make up the second half. Yeah. Uh, but we're all available, you know, for questions uh, offline too. Just send us any of, any of us an email and, um, and we'd like to hear from you. Um, and I'll just extend my thanks for, for coming today and, uh, and, and listening to us. And I also want to thank Phil and the other organizers for a great job today. So round of applause there. Yeah, thanks, sir. No, no, thank, thanks, thanks to everyone, first of all, for attending, and, and second, especially to you for uh, speaking and um, doing the q and I think that, that was a fun discussion. Um, so I enjoyed it anyway. Um, and then um, uh, especially as well, thank you to the RAS uh, and uh, the, the several people who've uh, supported us and um, 
you know, helped us put together things like the ticket system and the Zoom stuff and all of that stuff. We're really grateful uh, for their support. Um, so with that, I think we can actually finish exactly on time, which is unprecedented, just like those Hera upper limits. So with that dad joke, <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for coming in and uh, wish everyone a happy holiday season, as many of us are going into that. And uh, hopefully see you all, maybe even in person, at some time soon. <laughs> yes, please. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.